Is that's from a TV show? I can't remember which one it is, but hey, what time is it? It's, it's Pod, Pod Blast, Blast time! time. <laughs> Yes, it's Pod Blast time. I'm Chance Bartels, your host, and thank you for joining us tonight. And that music was by Darius Witherspoon from back on August 15th, 2018, right here on YouTube. Um, and if you're listening on fistfulofradio.com, I am live in my YouTube channel, The Nostalgic Pod Blast with a C, Nostalgic, not Nostalgia, the nostalgic pod blast but of course nostalgia is what this show is all about i love that version of the too close for comfort theme that was the ted knight show that we've talked about on the nostalgic pod blast and uh this guy darius witherspoon you should check out his youtube channel he has a lot of great music um he's a very uh a man of deep faith i've just communicated with him through youtube I've never met the man, but his work is incredible. He's obviously lost a lot of weight, too, since 2018. He's slimmed down a lot. And I thank him for the use of his version of Too Close for Comfort. And he created that background music, he said. That that track. Man, I love that. Anyway, uh, welcome to the show. What we are doing tonight, I've got a big, big show for you. A lot of news. And uh, we're going to also cover... A bit of history. This is going to be very educational. I have a list from the 1950s up until 1988 of TV theme songs that were released as 45 records throughout history that ranked on the Billboard charts in the top 60 hot Billboard charts. So you're going to hear, and these are in alphabetical order, starting obviously with the letter A. We'll get to that in a moment. Then later in the show, in our tagline segment, I have magazine taglines. So what happens in that game is I mention the tagline and you try to guess the magazine. Last week it was beer brands and I mentioned the tagline, for instance, uh, Head for the Mountains. That would be Bush Beer, right? Um, it don't get any better than this. You know, you know what a tagline is. You would name the product. I name the tagline. So we'll do that later. Now, let's start with the pop culture news item. Hawkeye dropped recently on Disney Plus, and uh, I checked it out um, over the holiday break. I've seen the first couple episodes, and you know, it's okay. Um, I love Marvel Studios. If you're watching on the YouTube channel, The Nostalgic Podblast, you can see all these comic book boxes behind me. Those are all Marvel comic books in alphabetical order. I've been collecting Marvel comic books since I was 10 years old. So I, I love them. I've read them. I collect them. And Marvel Studios has done a fantastic job. Um, I think of late, though, the last few movies have not really, really had like an emotional attachment um, like the previous movies did. Um, I didn't like I wasn't on pins and needles, um, but they weren't bad by any means. It's just I'm really excited for Spider-Man No Way Home. I think uh, Marvel's going to be back on track. But getting to Hawkeye, Hawkeye has always been since my comic book collecting early days my least favorite avenger just because he doesn't have any powers now a lot of you might say well what about batman batman has all the toys he's basically a wealthy guy and hawkeye of course is a marksman when it comes to the bow and arrow and uh the crossbow and you know he is an ingenious dude and uh and of course he's a spy and uh he'd worked for the government he's been an assassin 
And uh, Jeremy Renner plays him in the movies, and he does a fine job uh, playing Hawkeye. But one thing that really suspended my disbelief is that you had a, a girl with no powers who's 22 years old who also is skilled with a bow and arrow, basically wiping out an entire army of mafia thugs single-handedly. And look, I grew up watching the Bionic Woman, Wonder Woman, so I have no issue. I am not a misogynist. I have no problem at all with a female overpowering men. It's just this wasn't believable. If you watch it, I mean, it's great action, but just I just couldn't buy that this non-powered female in terms of a superpower just overpowered this whole army of dudes. I, I just found that to be a bit... Um, unbelievable but again i have no problem of course with captain marvel with all the incarnations of captain marvel sex has nothing to do with it it really doesn't i just didn't find it very believable um but i'm going to keep watching because marvel you never want to second guess marvel studios because in the end it'll be worthwhile as wandavision proved by the way disney is really cracking down on social media with the 20th century fox material that they absorbed when they bought 20th century fox movie and tv rights they bought the entire library for instance i had posted like a mystery science theater 3000 of a short scene from the 20th century fox 1972 hit movie the poseidon adventure the original version with gene hackman in the cast and an all-star cast directed by erwin allen and the other day, Disney blocked that. And that was like a year ago when I posted it. They blocked it worldwide. And that's their right. It's their material. So I can't complain. I'm just saying that they are they are really starting to crack down on that. And in fact, um, I have every episode of The Fall Guy, which is a 20th Century Fox series on 16 millimeter reel to reel film that I bought legally since 1995. I acquired the entire series. And so I did like some Facebook Live in the Mystery Science 3000 theater style um, in a Facebook group, the Fall Guy group. And I got a notice because I posted the unaired pilot, which is extremely rare. It's a studio print of the first episode and pilot of the Fall Guy that had Janet Lee as the Bell Bondswoman Soapy that Lee Major's character Colt Seavers works for on the side as a bounty hunter. And she was replaced by Joanne Flug when ABC picked up the show over 40 years ago to become a weekly series. So this is a very rare version. And I had posted it in that group, just a, a little bit of it, not the whole thing. And sure enough, Disney blocked it. And then like maybe a few hours later, the whole group went down and I'd posted a few live films of Fall Guy episodes, not in, in full, but just, you know, in comedic style, like Mystery Science 3000, like I said. And I, I think inadvertently I caused that whole group. It had thousands of members to go down. But there's other Fall Guy groups that are safely still on Facebook and on other applications of social media. But I felt guilty if I had something to do with that site going down. But let's move on with the show and talk about happier things. <laughs> I have a, uh, a quick Jeopardy update for you. Every week I like to discuss what's going on with Jeopardy because I'm a huge game show fan and game show nerd. And of course, I uh, I watch Jeopardy religiously. Although lately, um, I don't know what happened to Mayim. Uh, Ken Jennings, which ho who holds the record for the most wins, the most earnings of any game show in history and game show history, he's earned the most money. Of course, he has been hosting Jeopardy lately and I have a little issue with some things he said on social media about uh, people in wheelchairs. He made a really bad joke, and I'm all about free speech. It's just, uh, that really rubbed me the wrong way when he did that. Hold on. This is Jeopardy. I love this version of the theme. I call it the hyperactive Jeopardy theme from the 80s, from 1984. Wow. So the current Jeopardy champ closing in on over $300,000 is Amy Schneider. And to me, Amy Schneider looks like an actor who's deceased. He was a dwarf. 
named Michael Dunn, who is best known as the main villain, Dr. Loveless, in the classic CBS action-adventure series, The Wild Wild West. And I had posted in our Facebook group, The Nostalgic, with a C, Podblast, a side-by-side photo of Amy Schneider and the long-lost Michael Dunn, so you can compare. They really look a lot alike, and I wonder if they're related. I don't know. But it's pretty interesting, the resemblance. And Michael Dunn, of course, was in a classic Star Trek episode called Plato's Stepchildren Season 3, in which Kirk and Uhura kiss. It was the first interracial kiss in network television history. It was a great moment in television. But, the, you know, their lips didn't actually meet. Nichelle Nichols, who played Uhura, tells a story how it was a camera trick. They tilted. And if you watch it, you'll see they're not actually kissing, which is a shame. I wish they actually had kissed. But anyway, um, I'm all about free speech. So I'm, I'm watching. What I'm doing is I'm recording Jeopardy! With Ken Jennings hosting. I'm hoping Mayim comes back soon because I think she's doing a really awesome job as host. And uh, I'll just watch the final Jeopardy. I'll fast forward and zap to the very end and uh, so I can keep up with who's winning and what's going on. So Amy Schneider, keep rocking and rolling as you close in on some big bucks. You're already earning big bucks. Now we got some fun that's going on um, in today's show. We're going to move on beyond Jeopardy. This is pretty cool, I think. Um, let me set up this clip here. This is very brief. Here we go. Okay, I have a great, great television encyclopedia that I use routinely, and it was published in 1988. And in that book, there is a list of television shows whose main themes were released as 45 records from the 50s up until 1988. And so what I'm going to do tonight in the Nostalgic Pod Blast, in alphabetical order, I'm going to play a little bit of the record version of the theme. What's cool is there's different lyrics. It's different versions than the ones that you've seen all your life in reruns on MeTV, TV Land, streaming. And I love Pluto TV, by the way, um, and Paramount Plus and Disney Plus. I love that Disney Plus has put the Muppets, the Muppet Show back on the air from 1976 to 1981. I love that show. I applaud Disney Plus. I'm a very happy customer. Uh, I love seeing the classic stuff and the cartoons like Spider Woman that they've put out there. It's really good stuff. So I love it. I love it. But here we go with a list again of hit TV theme songs that did rank with Billboard's top 60 charts from the 50s until 1988. And these are great versions. First, I'm going to start with a classic version of a number one rated show for years, a groundbreaking sitcom. Think Norman Lear. And it's around now. Uh, ABC has done live presentations with Woody Harrelson as this main character. You know what I'm talking about. Let's listen. From Television City in Hollywood. Boy, the way Glenn Miller played. Songs that made the hit parade. Guys like us, we had it made. Those were the days. days. And you knew when you were there. <laughs> Dance for girls and men women. <laughs> Mister, we could use a man like Hyper Hoover again. Didn't need no welfare state. Everybody pulled his weight. G.R. Olasar and Great. Those were the days. Yeah. That's the version that we know and love from 1971 to 1979. And you know, in the first few years, they did not change it. A lot of people out there say that they changed every season the version of. All in the family in terms of a different version of them singing that's not true they did in later seasons did they did change it with the new session as it were but not every year especially not in the very beginning however we're not talking about that i want to play those were the days from 1971 on vinyl a 45 single record that was released by atlantic records and it reached number 43 on billboard's top 60 charts and you'll notice some different lyrics Let's listen to it. It sounds really cool. Those were the days. I love it. Here it is. Boy, 
Right away, Glenn Miller played. Songs that made the hit parade. Guys like me, we had it made. Those were the days. Didn't need no welfare state. Everybody pulled his weight. G.R.O. LaSalle went great. Those were the days. Great. I just love the differences in the lyrics. I think that's really, really cool. We got another one here. Um, and again, this is an alphabetical order. This is a show that was very short lived it's called Angie. And it starred the future star of Airplane and Airplane 2, the sequel, Robert Hayes and Donna Pascal, who had been in Saturday Night Fever. She was the girl in the back of the car. I'll leave it at that. And she's been on Match Game at the time. Uh, a really good actress, and uh, I'd never really watched the show. I remember vaguely seeing it when I was a kid. I'm old, but there was a theme song titled Different Worlds by Maureen McGovern, and it reached number 18 on Billboard's Top 60 charts in 1979. It was released by Warner Brothers, and it's kind of corny. It's not even a good couple skate song, but I'm going to play some of it as I go to the bathroom. I have to go pee-pee. <laughs> TMI, I know, but I want to play this. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the show a little bit when, when, it, when it's over. And it aired from 1979 to 1980 on ABC TV. This is Maureen McGovern. Yeah. 
Yikes. Uh, <laughs> uh, Maureen McGovern is definitely talented. I mean, nothing wrong with the way that was sung. It's just not my kind of song. But Angie, that was a sitcom. It aired from February 8th, 1979 until October 2nd, 1980 on ABC TV. As, as I said, uh, Angie was played by Donna Pescal. And then Robert Hayes played Brad Benson, who was a millionaire. And also in the cast was Doris Roberts, who we saw later, years later on Seinfeld, Deborah Lee Scott, who's no longer with us. And she was in Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. You saw her on Match Games, 76, 77, 78, et cetera, et cetera, back in the day. But according to my Bible, my TV Bible, published in 1988, Angie was a Cinderella story comedy about a pert young waitress, Angie, who finds her handsome and rich young prince. When Brad Benson first walked into the Liberty Coffee Shop, Angie thought he was a poor guy and began slipping in pastries. It turned out he was not only a pediatrician, a doctor from the medical building across the street, but he was from one of Philadelphia's richest families. Anyway, that was Angie. Again, what we're doing is counting down uh, some awesome, awesome theme songs that actually were released as record albums, as vinyl 45 record albums. Kids... You know what a record is? You know what a record is? It, it, they're producing record albums to this day. It's had a big time comeback. There's turntables being produced. It's quite expensive. Unlike back in the day when these records were new, they're very, very expensive. Anyway, that was Different Worlds. And like I said, it reached number 18 on the Billboard chart. Now, next up, this is one of the Rat Packers who sang this song. This is an alphabetical order. We're on the Bs now. When you hear the term Rat Pack, who do you think of? Well, this guy was one of the great talents. He's no longer with us. And he had a great moment on All in the Family, which we heard earlier. But this was the theme to Beretta. And this song was titled Keep Your Eye on the Sparrow, sang by the great Sammy Davis Jr. And it reached number 20 on the charts in 1976. It was released by 20th Century Records. That was the label that published this song. Let's listen. to the great Sammy Davis Jr. on vinyl. <laughs> Robert Blake starred as Beretta. Don't go to bed with no price on your head. No, no. Don't do it. No, no. Don't do the crime if you can't do the time. Ooh. Ain't gonna fight with no feet in the 
I love it. I love that. I love that theme. That was awesome stuff there by the great Sammy Davis Jr. So Beretta, Beretta, that was a number 20 hit, but the show started January 17th, 1975, and it ran until June 1st, 1978 on the ABC television network. And it first started airing on Friday nights from 10 to 11, and then it was moved to Wednesday nights at 10, and then Wednesday nights at 9, and then back to Wednesdays at 10, and then Thursday at 10. And Robert Blake played Detective Tony Beretta, and he had that parrot. Anyway, that's Beretta. Next up in the list, we're in the bees. What do you think is another really catchy theme song of a hit show? I'll give you a hint. It lasted three years in the 60s. And I have a version of it that was struck. There were a couple versions of this TV theme. This is the version by the Marquettes. And this is in glorious mono. But uh, it's a bit repetitive. This is a Warner Brothers Records release that reached number 17 on the Billboard charts in 1966. And you know what it is? It's Batman. Man, that's classic. That is classic. And what a great, great show as well, starring Adam West. And again, that was by the Marquettes. Um, and again, that reached number 17 on the Billboard charts of the top 60 songs. And that was in 1966. Now, continuing on with the bees, <clears throat> we have another theme that was released this time by Carlton Records in 1962 that hit number 28 on the charts. The orchestra was conducted by John Neal, spelled J-O-N, John Neal, N-E-E-L. And this was a theme to Ben Casey, which was a medical drama. Let's listen to a little bit of this theme. Ben to Ben Casey. <laughs> Sounds like Liberace playing the piano there. Thank you. 
Gene performing the Ben Casey theme. Now, here is a classic theme that's actually got singing and lyrics from a big hit, long running sitcom. And this is performed by Lester Flat and Earl Scruggs. And this is titled The Ballad of Jed Clampett, released by Columbia Records. It reached number 44 on the Billboard charts in 1962. You know it, you love it. Let's listen to a story about a man named Jed. Dueling banjos. I've been listening to my story about a man named Jed. Poor mountaineer barely kept his family fed. And then one day he was shooting at some food, and up through the ground come a bubbling fruit. All oh, that is black gold. Texas tea. Well, the first thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. Ken folks said, Jed, move away from there. He said, California is the place you ought to be. So he loaded up the truck and then moved to Beverly Hills, that is, swimming pools, movie stars. Say goodbye to Jed and all his kin. They would like to thank you folks for kindly dropping in. You're all invited back again to this locality to have a heap and help and of their hospitality. Beverly Hillbillies, that's what they call them now. Nice <laughs> folks. You all come back, yeah? That's awesome. I love that. And that's just down home. Great jamming. Great, great, great jamming on the banjo. But I thought it would have ranked higher than number 44 on the Billboard charts out of 60. But be it as it may. Now, next up, this is a theme to a classic song, and it's slightly different. This is the, again, this is a record album version, a single on 45 that peaked at number 19 on the charts for Billboard. This was a record released by United Artists Records in 1961. You'll recognize this theme and this show instantly. Oh. 
Is that rousing or what? And that was the seventh out of 36 theme songs we're going to cover from 19, the 1950s until 1988. The Billboard Top 60 charts. And that was Bonanza by Al C-A-I-O-L-A. -A, Al Saola. And that's an instrumental version, of course, just like the main theme on television. And it peaked, as I said, at number 19 for United Artist Records in 1961. So that concludes the B's. Now we're on to the C's, and we're going to flash forward to 1977 with this theme to a classic show. And this version is by Henry Mancini, who you know from the Pink Panther, who scored, dun -dun, dun -dun, dun -dun, dun -dun, you know, the Pink Panther theme. But check this out. This is really, really funky. RCA Records. <laughs> Thank you. 
Wow. Can't you hear the scratch of the record? I was holding up for the camera. If you're listening at fistfulofradio.com, we're on every Saturday and Sunday at two o'clock Eastern time, Atlanta, Georgia time where I'm at. And we're also Monday on Monday nights at seven with a brand new episode of the nostalgic pod blast. So that obviously was Charlie's angels. And, uh, that was by Henry Mancini and it hit number 45 on the billboard charts for RCA records. Our ninth TV theme that was released as a single peaked at number 10 on the Billboard charts back in 1962. This was a release by MGM Records. And this is the theme to Dr. Kildare titled Three Stars Will Shine Tonight, performed by the series star Richard Chamberlain. And again, this was, this was like Ben Casey, except he was a little more of a softer doctor. It was another medical drama. It was a big hit. And let's listen to the theme to Dr. Kildare. Three stars will shine tonight, one for the lonely. That star will shine its light, each time that someone sighs, three stars for all to see, one for young lovers, that star was made to be the sparkle in their eyes, and for the third star, only one reason a star you can wish on to make dreams come true high in the sky above three stars are shining i hope that star above will shine on you. And for the third star, only one reason. A star you can wish on to make dreams come true. High in the sky above, three stars are shining. I hope that star of love will shine down. Ah, ladies, 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 it's a crooner for you there, huh? Now, fellas, we are going, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to crack, crack the top five on the billboard charts with this theme song. And this is a record from 1953. 
I'm going to play a novelty version by Stan Freeberg. It's perfect for the holidays. This is about six minutes long, so bear with me. And I can take a break. I can take a break. I can go to the bathroom and <laughs> take a leak while this is going. But this is so great. Listen to this. This is the season. My name is Wednesday. My partner is Frank Jones. The chief is Captain Kellogg. December the 24th, Christmas Eve. They brought in a guy named Grudge. When I heard what they booked him on, my blood ran cold. It was a 409-6325-096704. Not believing in Santa Claus. 4.35 p.m. I was working the holiday watch at a homicide with Frank. Hang up your stock on yet, Joe? Yeah, just before I come down. You too, Frank? Always do. Hung it up early just in case I have to work late tonight. Wouldn't want to miss out when Santa Claus comes, you know. Mm-hmm. Sure wouldn't. Be a shame. What you gonna do tomorrow, Joe? What you gonna do on Christmas? You got any plans? Nothing much. Why don't you come by the house, Joe? We're gonna have Christmas dinner. You know, all the trimmings. Mm-hmm. Turkey, celery stuffing, oysters maybe, chestnuts. Mm-hmm. All the trimmings. Cranberry sauce. Love to have you. Mm-hmm. The missus always fixes a plate of relish with them little carrot sticks. You know, olives, pickles, scallions. Most folks call them green onions, but they're really scallions. Did you ever notice that, Joe? Ever notice what, Frank? How most folks call them green onions, but they're really scallions. Mm-hmm. Scallions. Anytime after two, Joe. Love to have you. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll see. Love to have you. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll see. The missus always fixes a plate of relish with them carrot sticks. You know them little carrot sticks? Mm-hmm. Olives, pickles, scallions. Mm-hmm. Let's not go through that again. Love to have you. Go through what again, Joe? How most folks call them green onions, but they're really scallions. Oh. You noticed that too, huh, Joe? <laughs> Homicide Wednesday. Mm-hmm. 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 What's the matter, Joe? What's the matter, Joe? Bringing a guy in on a 409-6325-096704. You, you mean? Yeah. Guy don't believe in scallions. I mean, Santa Claus. 629 p.m. We questioned the guy who didn't believe in Santa Claus. A guy named Grudge. Says here your name's Grudge, all right? Yeah! You said you didn't believe in Santa Claus? It's hard to believe what you said. Did you really say that? Sure I said it. How do you know there's a Santa Claus? You got a picture of him? No, no mugshot. Any fingerprints? Mm -mm, no latent prints. I just know that's all. It's like saying there isn't any Easter bunny. That's another guy there ain't no of. Mm -hmm. Well, that's your story, mister. Joe, he just said that to make me feel bad, didn't he? There really is an Easter bunny, isn't there? Joe? Listen, Grudge, didn't I pick you up three years ago in a 1492 for not believing in Columbus? Yeah. I don't believe in Cleveland or Cincinnati either. How about Toledo? I, uh, I ain't made up my mind yet about Toledo. Okay, mister. I get the picture now. You don't believe in nothing, do you? Nothing. And you want to know something else? What's that? I'm going to get up and I'm going to walk right out of this room. Because you guys ain't got nothing on me. There ain't no law against not believing in Santa Claus. There is in my book. Let me tell you something, mister. I'm going to prove there's a Santa Claus if it takes me all night. Yeah, pretty funny. The police department's got nothing else to do. Let me straighten you out, buddy. This one's on Frank and me. Right, Frank? Right, Frank? There really is an Easter bunny, isn't there, Joe? You know, hippity-hopping down the bunny trail? I took Grudge over to the helicopter, got in, flew around the city for hours. I showed him department stores. What's hurrying in and out of those department stores, Grudge? Happy people! But I ain't impressed! I showed him stockings. How were those stockings hung, Grudge? By the chimney with care. But I didn't hang none up. I showed them children nestled all snug in their beds. What's dancing in their heads, Grudge? Visions of sugar plums. But you ain't selling me. There ain't no Santa Claus. He still didn't believe. There was only one thing left to do. My job, get to the North Pole. 11.45 p.m., we arrived at the North Pole. I set the plane down. We walked over to Sandy's workshop, rang the bell. Pardon me, sir. Can I ask you a few questions? Why, sure. Just tickle me to death. What do you do for a living? I'm a brownie. What are you doing at the North Pole with a southern accent? Well, the boss sort of ran short on help this year, so he had to recruit a few of us brownies from the South Pole. Mm-hmm. That figures. <laughs> what a waste of time. Could we talk to your boss, please? Oh, he's out. You would come on the one night he's out in the whole year. Mm -hmm. What's your particular job, Mr. Brownie? My boss has eight tiny reindeer. My job, feed them. Mm -hmm, yes, sir. What do you feed them? Well, most times I fix up a little plate of relish. 
olives, pickles, and them carrot sticks. You know them little old carrot sticks? Mm-hmm. And scallions. Most, Most folks, folks call, call them green, green onions, onions, but they're, they're really scallions. scallions. How do you know? Just a stab in the dark. The little man showed us through the workshop. My boss will be back for a second load pretty soon. Say, would you all like to hear an interesting story? Yes, sir. Will you see that huge pile of presents over there? Mm -hmm. Man, look at all that stuff. Would you believe it? They're all for the same man. Been piling up here year after year. Why didn't the guy ever get them? Yeah, why? Because he didn't believe in my boss. You know the rules. Mm -hmm. We know. I uh, don't suppose there's no chance that this, this guy can still... Get the presents? Oh, sure. He gets them all. The minute he believes. But I don't suppose he ever will. Too bad about that guy. What's his name? Don't say it. I don't want to hear it. Come on, Mr. Brownie. What's his name? His name? Grudge. The Brownie saw us to the door. Wish us a Merry Christmas. We were heading back to the plane when it happened. Hey! Yeah, Grudge? You know that guy I said I didn't believe in? Who's that? S -s Santa Claus? Yes, sir. You think I'm too old to change my mind? You're never too old, Mr. Grudge. Well, then I... I I believe in Santa Claus and Columbus. How about Cleveland, Cincinnati, and Easter Bunny? Yeah, them too. And Toledo? I I still ain't made up my mind yet about Toledo. Look, Grudge, up in the sky. He's coming back for the second load. It's Santa Claus! It's Santa Claus! There's the only guy I know can make everybody happy in one night. Yeah. He must have the biggest heart in the whole world. That's about the size of it. Isn't that great? By the way, happy Hanukkah to all everyone out there who celebrates with the lights. And happy holidays and Merry Christmas to everybody else. Uh, I just love that. That's a great novelty record by Stan Freeberg and his orchestra for Capitol Records, 1953. But here is the version that hit number three on the charts. And by the way, there's three theme songs that hit number one on the Billboard charts that we're going to listen to tonight on the Nostalgic Pod Blast. But let's listen to the theme that you know and love that hit number three on the charts to Dragnet. And this is by Ray Anthony.
I love that. And I love big band music. So that rounded up the first 10 of our classic TV themes that were released as successful record albums on the Billboard charts. At number 11, this is also in the letter D in alphabetical order. And I'll give you a hint of what this song is about and what show this was. This is something for Generation Xers. This aired Friday nights on CBS alongside just before The Incredible Hulk and then Dallas at 10 p.m. in the late 70s and early 80s. We're talking about them Dukes, the Duke boys. And here's the great Waylon Jennings. Again, notice different lyrics. This version was released on record on vinyl as a 45 by RCA Records in 1980. Take it away, Waylon. Just a good old boy. Never meaning no harm. Be told you never saw them in trouble where the law since the day they was born. Daisy Duke. Straight in the curve. Yeah. Flying in the hills. Someday the mountain might get them, but the law never will. Making their way the only way they know how. That's just a little bit more than the law of the life. love it you gotta love Waylon. you gotta love the dukes of hazard that reached number 21 on the billboard charts charts Waylon jennings theme from dukes of hazard the good old boys so now we're going to move on to another show another show that was another big hit this was on abc tv and this was done by bill conti bill conti who uh had scored a lot of like movies as well as other tv shows but this was a big nighttime hit soap opera going to play for you now called Dynasty, which I call Die Nasty, which aired from 1981 to 
I love that. And I'm going to play, even though I didn't really like the show that much, I like that music a lot. And uh, Bill Conti, C O N T I, <laughs> got to be careful with that one. He scored for Your Eyes Only, the 1981 release James Bond movie over 40 years ago. But here's a version. And by the way, that version reached number 52 on the Billboard Top 60 charts in 1982 on Arista Records. Um, now, I'm going to play another version. This is by the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. I just think this is beautiful music. And let's listen to this. It's Dynasty and... No, seriously, that is beautiful music. I don't care what you say. Great music. But now we're going to get to something that charted a lot higher with actual music. I mean, lyrics. And this charted at number two in the Billboard charts in 1981, over 40 years ago. This is Joey Scarberry with music by the great Mike Post. This was released by Electra Records back in 81. As I said, believe it or not, we're going to listen to this. The greatest American hero. Yeah. Mike Post had so many great hits. We're going to go over a lot of them tonight. Number two on the Billboard charts. Look at what 
what's happened to me. I can't believe it myself. Suddenly I'm up on top of the world. It should have been somebody else. Believe it or not, I'm walking on air. I never thought I could feel so free. By the way, on a wing and a prayer. Who could it be? Believe it or not. Like the light of a new day, it hit me from out of the blue, breaking me out of the spell I was in, making all of my wishes come true. Believe it or not, I'm walking on air. I never thought I could feel so free. Look at me falling for you. Joey Scarberry. Now that was number 13 on the chart and we got 36 total theme songs to cover tonight as well as some other news and we're going to play taglines and have some other fun. But here's number 14. This hit number five on the Billboard charts. This is Pratt and McLean with Brother Love on Reprise Records on that record label. This is a big hit show and I love this variation of this classic theme. I don't want to give away what it is, but let me just play it for you now. It's set in the 1950s. This was a hit sitcom. Going to throw some hints out there. And here it is. Let's just take a trip down memory lane here. Monday, happy days. Tuesday, Wednesday, happy days. Thursday, Friday, happy days. Saturday, what a day. Rock and roll, keep the new. This day is on. School ring on a chain. She's my steady. I'm her man. I'm gonna love her all I can. Saturday. 
sky, hello blue. Stuck and hold me when I hold you. Feel so right, can't be wrong. Rocking and rolling all the way down. released in 1976 as a 45 record happy days and that was of course starting with season three of happy days they had the bill haley and the comets rock around the clock as the theme to happy days in season one and two the original version but i like that those different lyrics in that version now number 15 this reached number 33 on the billboard charts back in 1962 and this was the instrumental theme to have gun will travel by Dwayne Eady for RCA Victor Records. Let's check it out, shall we? As I find this clip for you on the Nostalgic Podblast, thanks for listening. Of course, as I mentioned, we're on fistfulofradio.com. That's where you can stream us uh, on the radio, Saturdays and Sundays at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And then we're also on Monday nights at seven with a new episode. And then we're overnight, every night, every morning on fistfulofradio.com and then of course we're in the facebook group the nostalgic pod blast please join we give away things all the time that's what's in it for you to join the facebook group and then we're also on youtube of course which we're at right now live now let's listen to the ballad of paladin from have gun will travel <laughs> Now let's go to 1969 for a top five hit, big hit, long running show that aired from 1968 until 1980. And uh, this version of the theme was by the Ventures and this hit number four, it topped off at number four in this release by Liberty Records. I love this percussion, this drum beat. You can't beat it.
exciting the ventures now i remember sanford and son used that very version in 1976 in a three-part story that was shot or taped in hawaii and uh the first part was a one-hour episode the second i mean the third part well actually all right it was two weeks cut into three parts for rerun syndication that's why i get confused the first episode was a one-hour episode the second one was a half hour total length 90 minutes including commercials for both all three for all three of those uh segments actually it's two segments you see what i'm saying it's confusing and they use that music and also music from another hit theme song that was released as a record that we'll talk about later in tonight's pod blast but now number 17 on our list this hit number 38 on the billboard charts which was a real tv theme by someone who had a show who was very very popular uh, also like i said 1969 this is Here Come the Brides by Perry Como. And this is titled Seattle. Let's listen to the actual 45 record. The blue is the blue skies you've ever seen are in Seattle. And the hills, the greenest green in Seattle. Like a beautiful child growing up free and wild, full of hopes and full of fears, full of laughter, full of tears, full of dreams to last the years in Seattle, in Seattle. When it's time to leave your home and your loved one. It's the hardest thing a boy can ever do And you pray that you will find Someone warm and sweet and kind But you're not sure what's waiting there for you The bluest skies you've ever seen are in Seattle And the hills of the greenest green in Seattle like a beautiful child growing up free and wild full of hopes and full of fears full of laughter full of tears full of dreams to last the years in seattle in seattle When you find your own true love, you will know it by her smile, by the look in her eyes. Set of pine trees in the air, never knew a day so fair. It makes you feel so proud that you could cry. The bluest sky you ever seen are in Seattle. And the hills, the greenest green and Seattle. Like a beautiful child growing up free and wild, full of hopes and full of fears, full of laughter, full of tears, full of dreams to last the years in Seattle. In Seattle.
Don't send any hate mail, but that's Perry Como, and I think he's extremely boring. Boring, boring, boring. Number 18. Let's flash forward to 1981. We're back with Mike Post. And he composed a theme that was released as a record album, as a single, and it climbed to number 10 on the Billboard charts with this instrumental classic for Electra Records. Have you figured out what it is? Well, I love this. It's pretty mellow. It's pretty chill. Let's listen. Hill Street Blues. You know, I didn't give a rat's ass for that show, but man, I like that music by Mike Post. Man, that's good. Now, here is a very strange version of a classic TV theme that was released on vinyl in 1977, and it climbed to number 24 on the Billboard charts. I'm not going to reveal what it is. I want you to guess what this is. This is outrageous.
version of I Love Lucy by Wilton Place Street Band. And they produced Disco Lucy for Island Records. Wow. So that concludes letter I. Now, number 20 out of 36. This hit number 25 in the Billboard charts in 1976. Slightly different version than what you heard on TV ad nauseum. But let's listen to this by Cindy Greco. there yeah that was uh making our dreams come true obviously the theme from laverne and shirley by cindy greco and uh like i said it hit number 25 in the billboard charts in 1976 for private stock records at number 21 mike post did it again did it again with another hit tv theme song that was released and made a lot of money and let's see this was in like i said 1982 <laughs>
That was on Electra Records. And again, Magna PI hit number 25 on the top 60 Billboard charts with that 45 record. So now I have a strange one. This show lasted only seven weeks in 1979. I'll talk more about this show briefly, but actually I like this song and the star of this show sang this song, but well, unlike Lee Majors in The Fall Guy, this guy could sing. Nothing against Lee Majors. I'm a big fan of his, but let's be honest. He's not the best singer in the world, but let's uh, check this out. And this was on RSO Records. And I really, really like this song. You can laugh at me. I don't care. I don't care. I like it. This is David Naughton. If I could get the damn thing to play. I don't know why I won't play. Come on now. <laughs> skating classic right there but that show making it there's some brief info on that um it starred the guy that sang that song as i mentioned and it debuted on february 1st 1979 and only made it to march 23rd 79 and um the short-lived show was a thinly disguised tv adaptation of the hit movie saturday night fever the disco freak here was a young college student named billy who was torn between the glaring life of a big man on the dance floor and his more practical desire to complete his education and become a teacher. So anyway, I just want to give you some background of the more obscure shows. I mean, the obvious ones like the Magnum PIs, I'm not going to bore you with details. We've talked about those shows before in the Nostalgic Pod Blast anyway. So that was number 22, making it. Now, number 23 out of 36 TV songs between the 50s and 1988. 
that were released as record albums that were successful on the charts. This one is from 1955. So we're going back in time a bit. Again, this is an alphabetical order. That's why we're skipping around. And let me pull the clip for you. And I'll tell you what it's about. Columbia Records. Release this. The theme to Medic, titled Blue Star by Felicia blue Sanders. Blue star, when I am blue, all I do is look at you, for I seem to find peace of mind, and I never get lonely when. You shine from afar With you away up there I don't dare to have a care For I want to show That your glow lets me know that you know that I'm not blue, blue star. Columbia Records. So they hit number 29 on the Billboard charts for Columbia Records. Now I want to play an instrumental version that was released that same year. But this one was by Capitol Records. And this is performed by Les Baxter, who conducted this music. Let's listen to that. If I can find that clip really quickly, and then I'll tell you a little bit about this show, The Medic. Let's see here, The Medic theme. Here we are. I love this piano.
stuff. So I called it the medic. It was actually called medic. Let's let me just tell you a little bit about what the show was about from the 1950s. It debuted on September 13th, 1954. And it ran through November 19th, 1956 on NBC, Monday nights from 9 to 9.30. And the star, the main character, was Dr. Conrad Steiner, S-T-Y-N-E-R, played by Richard Boone. And that theme, Blue Star, was by Edward Hyman and Victor Young. And the synopsis of the show, Medic, was about case histories from the files of the Los Angeles County Medical Association, which were dramatized in the that film series in its efforts to present the practice of medicine realistically medic was shot at real hospitals and clinics and often used real doctors and nurses as part of the cast dr steiner was the host and narrator of the series as well as a frequent participant in the cases his introduction to each episode was always included with the description of the doctor, guardian of birth, healer of the sick, and comforter of the aged. The dramas generally centered around the struggle to preserve life and the tragedies and triumphs, triumphs that resulted. Medic was a pioneer in TV realism and was the first starring vehicle for actor Richard Boone. Its pretty theme song, Blue Star, was quite popular during 1955. Very cool. So moving on, number 24 out of 36 TV shows that were released as singles on 45 on vinyl and charted in the top 60 on the Billboard charts. This is an awesome artist here that you know from traditional music and pop and soul, Isaac Hayes. Again, this is in alphabetical order. So now I'm going to read you, after I play this theme, a little bit about the show that was titled The Men. And this, in 1972, charted at number 38 for Strax Records. The Men. Stax Records. Stax Records. I got to correct myself. S T A X. Stax Records. Sorry. short there that is a cool cool theme man and it went to number 38 on the charts the men for stacks records the show only lasted one season on abc and i'm going to read you a little bit about it 
The Men. Aired from September 21st, 1972 until September 1st, 1983. Thursday nights from 9 to 10, from September 72 to January 73. And then from January 73 to September 73, Saturdays from 10 to 11. That's what killed it, I bet, when ABC moved it from Thursday night at 9 to Saturday night at 10. Isaac Hayes sang, uh, performed that awesome theme music. And this was the umbrella title for three rotating series titled Assignment Vienna, Delphi Bureau, and Jigsaw. At first, these segments rotated in normal fashion, each one appearing every third week. However, in January 73, when the men moved to Saturdays, the rotation scheme was changed, and each element appeared for several weeks in a row as follows. Anyway, January 13th to February 10th was Assignment Vienna. February 17th to March 3rd was Jigsaw. March 17th to April 7th was Delphi Bureau. April 14th to June 9th was Assignment Vienna again. And then June 16th to August 11th was Jigsaw. And then finally, August 18th to September 1st was Delphi Bureau. Hmm. Very interesting. So that was the theme. And... Ah, that was number 24 on our list. Now, we finally got into a number one charted Billboard song that was a TV theme. Can you guess what it was? This is the year 1985. Big hit show set in Miami. Now, that gives it away. Jan Hammer. Let's listen to this. Miami Vice. Number one. I couldn't stand those nineteen eighties synthetic drums. In songs and TV themes, all sorts of music back in the 80s, and especially in the mid 80s. <laughs> so stupid. short there Miami Vice it was a number one single and TV theme from that show now we're going to go back to the 60s back to 1968 your mission should you choose to accept it is, is to listen to this Thank you. 
Scored by Lalo Schifrin, Mission Impossible. That hit number 41 on the charts. It was released by Dot Records as a single. Now, that was the second piece of music that was featured in that 90-minute Sanford and Son. The Hawaii Adventure and Greg Morris was a diamond thief, a jewel thief. And when they showed the diamonds, they played that version of the Mission Impossible theme. By the way, this 90-minute... Uh, Sanford and Son episode was titled The Hawaiian Connection. And like I said previously, it was a one-hour episode that aired on September 24th, 1976, and then it concluded a week later on October 1st, 1976, as a half-hour episode, 90 minutes total, including commercials. Number 27 on our list of 36 theme songs that released his records, Henry Mancini is back with his orchestra. And this time he landed at number 21 on the Billboard charts in 1960, with this single 45 release titled Mr. Lucky for RCA Victor Records. And after I play it, I'm going to read you just a little bit, tell you a little bit, and read from my TV Bible about this show, Mr. Lucky, since it's a rather obscure title from long ago. Let's listen to Mr. Lucky. <laughs> Mr. Lucky, Henry Mancini. Again, it landed at number 21 on the Billboard charts in 1960 for RCA Victor record label. Now that show, Mr. Lucky, debuted on CBS the same at the same time as The Twilight Zone, but it only lasted one year, Mr. Lucky did. And it ran from October 24th, 1959 until September 3rd, 1960. And here's what it's about. Mr. Lucky was an honest professional gambler who had won a plush floating casino, like a floating crap game. That's a honeymooners joke there. I stole from the honeymooners uh, Dick and Lisa show skit. Anyway, the ship Fortuna uh, made its base of operations at sea, staying beyond the 12 mile limit where he could operate a gambling ship legally. Mr. Lucky played host to a variety of people, all of whom came to make use of his sumptuous facility. Helping him run the casino was his good friend, Andamo, 
And when he got into scrapes that required police assistance, Lieutenant Rovax usually provided help. The music from the series, composed by Henry Mancini, produced two successful albums titled The Music from Mr. Lucky and Mr. Lucky Goes Latin, based on the 1943 movie of the same name starring Cary Grant. Mr. Lucky. Now we're going to flash forward to the 1980s. Oh, can you hear my mic just hammering around as I fumble through my book? But we're going to flash forward to the 80s in Al Jarreau in 1987 with this show that starred Bruce Willis and Sybil Shepherd, titled Moonlighting. Let's listen to a little bit of the theme, which was a hit record. so much moonlighting however that song did hit number 23 on the billboard top 60 songs as a release for wea records moonlighting now number 29 you best get out that bubble machine because here comes lawrence wilk with his orchestra this is a very unusual version of a theme to a show that lasted 12 seasons, one of the most popular television shows and most popular sitcoms in all of television history. Let's listen to this theme. You'll figure out what it is. It's very strange, this version. <laughs> Thank you. 
toe tapper. <laughs> Get it? My three sons. That was released by Dot Records, D O T Dot Records, and it hit number 55 out of 60 top Billboard songs for 1961. Number 30 in our list of 36 TV themes that were released as record album singles. This is the Ray Anthony Orchestra, and this went to number eight on the charts with this hit tune for Capitol Records. And you'll know this music if you've seen 16 Candles by John Hughes. Even if you've never seen this very violent TV show, you'll know the music. Let's listen to it, shall we? That's tight. A Capitol Records release, and it went to number eight, 1959, baby. Wow. Number 31 on our list of 36 TV th theme songs that were successful records. This is going to the 70s in 1975, and we're back to the awesome Mike Post. I love this theme. There's an MGM record single for the MGM record label.
I love that. Hit number 10 on the charts. I thought it would have charted higher. It was by MGM Records. Now, at number 32, the Nelson Riddle Orchestra scored something a few years before they scored the Batman theme. But this was on the charts at number 30. Don't want to confuse you. It's number 32 in alphabetical order of hit TV show single releases. <clears throat> but it was number 30 on the Billboard charts. And this is Nelson Riddle's <clears throat> for Capitol Records in 1962, his orchestration of Route 66. And I love this theme. <laughs> released in 1962 by Capitol Records. Now, number 33, we finally hit our second of three number one Billboard hits. And it was a TV show theme song. Can you guess what it is? This is by Rhythm Heritage. Nineteen seventy five SWAT.
and listen, I noticed something. I think the Japanese sampled some audio from that theme. It sounded like in the Pac-Man game when Inky, Binky, Clyde, and Pinky, um, when they go from blue to their regular forms where they can eat you, eat the Pac-Man, you go, woo, 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 woo. You hear the siren? I heard it sounded just like it in that 1975 tune. And, of course, Pac-Man, I don't think, hit the scene until 1980. Interesting. Play it back. I heard it. I heard it. I heard it in my headphones there. But moving on, we're winding down our list of 36 in alphabetical order TV theme songs that were hit records. And that was number one, SWAT. Wow. Now at number 34, here's Johnny Rivers. He went to number three in the Billboard charts back in 1966 with this from Imperial Records. This is an awesome, awesome. Actually, it's a really good song. It's not just a great theme and TV show. Let's listen to this theme and song. <laughs> To everyone he meets, he stays a stranger. With every move he makes, and other chance he takes, odds are he won't live to see tomorrow. Secret agent man, secret agent man, they've given you a number. Taking away the name. Beware of all pretty faces that you find. A pretty face can hide an evil mind. Oh, be careful what you say. You give yourself away. Odds are you won't live to see tomorrow. Secret Asian man, secret Asian man, they've given you a number and taken away your name. sounded like a beach party didn't it wow now here's our third and final number one tv hit single record and you know this show i thought it was an okay show but i like the song a lot and this let's see this hit in 1975 number one on the billboard top 60 chart from reprise records Welcome back Your dreams were your ticket out Welcome back To that same old place that you laughed about 
Well, the names have all changed since you hung around. But those dreams have remained and they've turned around. Who'da thought they'd need ya? Who'da thought they'd need ya? Back here where we need ya. Back here where we need ya. Yeah, we tease him a lot. Cause we got him on the spot. Welcome back. 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 We always could spot a friend. Welcome back. And I smile when I think how you must have been. And I know what a scene you were learning in. Was there something that made me come back again? And what could ever lead you? What could ever lead you? Back here where we need you. Back here where we need you. Yeah, we tease him a lot because we got him on the spot. Welcome back. Number one on the charts by John Sebastian. Welcome back from Reprise Records there. And we've reached our last sitcom, our television show that had a release that was a hit record. This is the letter Z. And a lot of people might be wondering, why didn't you separate it by, you know, counting up to number one? Well, there are three number ones. I wanted to do it in alphabetical order. I just did, so sue me, okay? Oh, I shouldn't say that because I'm playing some music that I hope is okay to play. But here is number 36 on our list, finally. In alphabetical order, in our list of 36 hit songs released as 45 single records, that ranked in the top 60 Billboard charts from the 1950s until 1988 is this from the Cordettes in 1958 for Cadence Records. Gave you a hint. The letter is Z. What do you think it could be? Z. What show? Hmm. Well, I'm going to play it right now. It was a Disney show. Out of the night when the full moon is bright Comes a horseman known as sorrow His old renegade carves a sea with his blade a sea that stands for sorrow. 
which starred Guy Williams, whose real name by birth is Armando Catalina. And uh, he went on to play Professor John Robinson in Lost in Space after Walt Disney's Zorro. So that concludes our list of 45 single record albums. And we can move on to another topic. And by the way, if you're listening on fistfulofradio.com, on camera, I'm showing some 45 records, some collectibles in the background. So it's always cool to check out the Nostalgic Podblast YouTube channel or the Facebook group. Thank you very much for doing so. So since we've been talking about 45s, let's talk about another 45. Here is a major Oscar-winning movie that actually turned 45 not too long ago in November 2021, and I'm going to play a clip of this movie. It's a classic, and it spawned so many sequels. Let's listen to... Actually, I'm going to play the theme before I play the trailer because I just love this music. From vinyl. Bill Conti again. We talked about him earlier tonight in the Nostalgic Pod Blast. What a classic theme. Rocky. Rocky Balboa. Mr. John Lombardi posted about it in our Facebook group, The Nostalgic Pod Blast. And I will read you in a moment what he wrote. Such a triumphant theme. In your face now. Great workout tune, man. Good shit. Rocky. Happy 45th birthday, Rocky. So John Lombardi wrote November 26th, 1976, the motion picture Rocky premiered in New York City. Written by and starring newcomer Sylvester Stallone, the film portrays a small-time boxer who overcomes all odds to earn a once-in-a-lifetime shot. At the heavyweight championship, an American classic, the movie garnered 10 Academy Award nominations and it won three Oscars, including Best Picture, and it began a franchise of popular sequels. Here's from something I found from Wikipedia. Rocky won the Oscar for Best Picture, directed by John G. Adelson, written and starring, written by and starring Sylvester Stallone. 
It tells the rags to riches American dream story of Rocky Balboa, an uneducated, kind hearted, working class Italian American boxer working as a debt collector for a loan shark in the slums of Philadelphia. Rocky, a small time club fighter, gets a shot at the World Heavyweight Championship. The film also stars Talia Shire as Adrian, Burt Young as Adrian's brother, Polly, the great Burgess Meredith as Rocky's trainer, Mickey, and Carl Weathers as the reigning champion, Apollo Creed. The film, made on a budget of just over $1.1 million, was a sleeper hit, and it earned $225 million in global box office receipts, becoming the highest grossing film of 1976. Rocky was critically acclaimed and solidified Stallone's career and was the beginning of his rise to prominence as a major movie star of that era. Among other accolades, it received 10, as John mentioned, Academy Award nominations, winning three, including Best Picture, as I just said. In 2006, the Library of Congress selected the film Rocky for preservation in the United States National Film Registry for being culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. Critics con consider Rocky one of the greatest sports films ever made. And the American Film Institute ranked it as the second best in the genre after Raging Bull. The film has spawned Eight sequels, Rocky II in 1979, Rocky III, my favorite in 1982, we'll bust you up, Mr. T, and uh, uh, just, just a great film, Rocky IV in 1985, Rocky V in 1990, Rocky Balboa in 2006, The Great Creed in 2015, Creed II, and then Creed III, which is scheduled for release in 2022. Now let's listen to the trailer to the original Rocky. You'll recognize these scenes. It's just such a such a triumphant movie, just like the music is triumphant. I love it. It's very inspirational. And I got it right here. Let me see. There's probably going to be a damn ad. Let me try to get... Nope, here we go. Awesome, awesome sauce. Let me start it from the top because I just love that. Happy birthday, Rocky. To live in? It's a waste of life. I feel if a great the guy's dumb, he gets laid off, right? He can't make it. Yeah, well, don't figure. Let me do the figure, okay, Rock? From here, man, just let me do the figure. Come on! Well, you know me, come on! I'll fix both of them so they don't work for you. <laughs> You and your girl, Adrian, you have a nice time, eh? Thanks. Ron. What? Tell me what I told you. What'd you tell me? Take it to the zoo. Oh, come on, come on! is the land of opportunity. Yeah. Apollo Creed does. And he's going to prove it to the whole world by giving an unknown a shot at the title. I need your help about 10 years ago, right? 10 years ago. You never helped me. You didn't care. Well, if you wanted help. I say, if you wanted help, why didn't you ask? Why didn't you just ask me? Look, I asked, but you never heard nothing. What is there going the distance from Creed? If I can go that distance, Adrian! that bell rings and I'm still standing. I weren't just another bum from the neighborhood. I mean, who am I kidding? I ain't even in the guy's league. Wish me luck. I'm gonna need it. Good luck. Don't leave town. Oh, my God. 
movie i'll never forget that scene where he eats his raw eggs Ugh. but rocky is just one of the classics the great american classic movies and you know what a sleeper like when i when i was talking about a sleeper success that means a movie that gets discovered after the fact um or one that's not expected to be a success and it is anyway um a lot of movies like in on cable especially in the late 70s um on hbo home box office for instance you know a lot of movies would run there and get discovered you know that didn't do well at the box office but then it wound up selling um for big bucks um and home in the home video market on like uh laser disc disco vision and vhs back in the day and then of course dvd blu-ray and now streaming uh here in 2021 almost 2022 how time flies so uh yeah rocky's one of the best now also item on November 26, 1986, 35 years ago, this movie debuted, and it's one of my favorites in the series. I'm going to play a couple scenes of this movie. Avoid the planet Earth at all costs. We are under the attack of an opening probe. Notify all stations. Starfleet emergency. Red alert. Earth is on the edge of destruction. We cannot survive unless a way can be found to respond to the problem. The key to saving the future. Spock, you're talking about the end of every life on Earth. Can be found only in the past. We're going to attempt time travel. Sulu, take us home. These are the voyages of the crew of the Starship Enterprise. Judging by the pollution content of the atmosphere, I believe we have arrived at the latter half of the 20th century. Stardate, 1986. San Francisco. Our own world is waiting for us to save it. They have 24 hours. Everybody remember where we parked. Break up. To complete their mission. You look like a cadet review. We will beam in tonight, collect the photons, and beam out. I want you all to be very careful without being discovered. We have an intruder. All right, who are you? You're not exactly catching us at our best. That much is certain. This is an extremely primitive and paranoid culture. What does it mean, exact change? Many of their customs will doubtless take us by surprise. We're ready for beam out. My transporter power is down to minimal. I've got to bring in one at a time. You're from outer space. No, I'm from Iowa. Well, I only work in outer space. Let's do our job and get out of here. Freeze! Take off, can you hear me? Freeze! I'm coming with you. You can't. Our next stop is the 23rd century. Pull power now. Shields at maximum. Steady. Hold on tight, lassie. Can we make breakaway speed? That's all I can give you. Book eight. Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. When that was released, um, I must have been 15 years old, and I didn't give a shit about Star Trek. I really didn't. But I saw that movie, and that's what turned me on to Trek. I'm a big Trekker now, um, and I love watching the new Star Trek incarnations on Paramount Plus on streaming. Um, but I loved that movie, and I love that character um jillian uh, and captain kirk should have wound up with her i like that she was um fearless and she sacrificed everything she knew to go into the time of captain kirk what is that the 20 uh the 23rd century or something and i thought that was so cool uh, marine biologist and she sacrificed everything 
anyway, if she were real, of course, I think that she should have wound up with Kirk. And there was like a, uh, a graphic novel called Dead of Honor that this guy Barry told me about. Um, and it continues their relationship. And, you know, she had to get, you know, up to speed, like it says at the end of Star Trek four. Anyway, um, I saw it at the new Columbia theater in the Atlanta, Georgia area. And this was a great historic, huge theater screen. It had 70 millimeter. Our friend Al Hardy was a projectionist there. And it was demolished by a church for parking. I am so pissed about that. This was a historic. They had lobby cards in it. It was a historic Atlanta landmark, the Columbia Theater or the new Columbia Theater. It was up there with the Fox Theater in terms of an Atlanta landmark. And it was just bulldozed for friggin' parking for a church. Nothing against religion. Look, I'm a believer, right? But it kind of really what, pissed me off so bad when that happened. But I want to play. This is on my YouTube channel, Chance Acting Demo. I recorded this back on November 26, 1986. And then the next night, William Shatner hosted Saturday Night Live. And the phrase, get a life, was coined by one of the writers. Shatner didn't write that. That wasn't Nad Lib. It might have been Conan O'Brien, who was a writer on SNL in those days and late 1986 he might have written i don't know i need to research that who wrote that line but one of the saturday night live writers before the show get a life with starring chris elliott <clears throat> first time you ever heard that in pop culture was when william shatner said get a life in a parody of a star trek convention on saturday night live but now um i just want to play this re review I, I recorded this like i said november 26th 86 at night i recorded some local atlanta media put it on my youtube channel chance acting demo listen to this asshole reporter trashing star trek 4 despite the overwhelming positive response from people that actually saw the movie this is from wsb tv from november 26 1986 from my very own youtube channel let me see if i can get this to go here it is uh yeah and to spend a part of the holiday in a movie theater and this is channel 2 action news for hinton it's very Hickory rare flat and the rest of georgia <laughs> Listen to this dickhead. Not him, not the anchor, the guy on the scene at the New Columbia. Peter Bannon, he's a dick. Take a look at this line outside the Columbia Theater tonight on Peachtree. It really doesn't matter what the picture is like when you have got a ravenous audience of Trekkies ready for anything. Why? It's Star Trek. You gotta wait. I'm a Trekkie. These are all types of people. Black, white, Asian. Is this going on national television? No. Okay. Why? <laughs> Why? I love Star Trek. Love Black woman. Great. Are you Trekkies? Yeah. Yes. yes. To be kids. precise, Star Trek IV, the fourth movie based on the 60s TV series that apparently found immortality after 70s reruns. Star Trek has always been, for me, low-tech sci-fi. I have never understood the appeal of these 23rd century space police settling questions of intergalactical ethical concern but millions do and they love these do-gooders which is why the movie has great appeal even with the obviously aging and pot-bellied original cast oh fuck you Star Trek for subtitle the voyage home has the enterprise crew in an alien rent a spaceship returning in time to san francisco in the year 1986 to save the whales so fitting for that reporter that peter bannon guy that scene i find it boring but it is not meant for me you guys say you saw the movie right yeah, yeah. prove it here's my popcorn okay what'd you think oh it was excellent worth the wait excellent. yes it's worth the wait. better than one two or three better than all of them what'd you think two black excellent. men that's one of the four what are you doing here what am i doing here I love it. I was born too early. I should have been born in that century. I think you people are really going to enjoy and get their money's worth fully. Everybody seems to agree the movie was worthwhile. Fine. I'll tell you what's not worthwhile. In the big ad in the paper, down here is a number to call. It'll cost you 50 cents to talk to the Enterprise crew. If you want to talk to the Enterprise crew's answering system, waste 50 cents. Otherwise, it's a happening. From the Columbia Theater, this is Peter Bannon, Channel 2 Action News. What an asshole. Our nightlife reporter, Lisa Clark, says Star Trek IV is more than worth the wait. Here's a polar opposite. This is brief. This is only another minute or so. I want to play WAGA-TV, which at the time was a CBS affiliate. Now it's a Fox affiliate in Atlanta, Georgia. Listen to this review. 
and wait, they did. Crowds piled up along Peachtree Street this evening as people lined up for a seat at the biggest screen in town, the Columbia, and the latest installment of the Star Trek movie series. We're proposing that we go backwards in time, find humpback whales, then bring them forward in time, drop them off, and hope the hell they tell this probe what to go do with this cell. That's a general idea. Well, that's crazy. You know. On this voyage, Admiral Kirk and company set out to save the world from a dastardly space probe. The mission involves time travel, landing the crew in present-day San Francisco. The anachronisms are, of course, hilarious. In this two-hour epic, there is plenty of technological razzle-dazzle, but that's not the chief selling point. It's emphasizing our people again. DeForest Kelly. And From Atlanta, born in Atlanta. All of us have a, a meaningful part in this film, that uh, we're all working together like we used to. For ardent Trekkies, seeing Kirk, Spock, Bones, Scotty, Chekhov, Sulu, and Uhura will be a happy reunion. And thanks to a script that is full of wit and warmth, Star Trek IV is a delightful voyage for those who may not even know what a Klingon is. I have a hunch that we'd all be a lot happier discussing this over dinner. You guys like Italian? No. Yes. Yes. No. no. Yes. No. Yes. I love Italian. And so do you. Yes. Turkey check elsewhere because you won't find it here. This is a real winner. This is what one of those movies. Yes, I am wearing a mic. Yes, this is one is. of those movies that the audience will break into applause from time to time. Just a heck of a lot of fun. Star Trek Four is that rarest of sequels. It's even better than the ones that came before, and I can hardly wait for Star Trek Five. Put Spock on some of the Marta trains I've been on, you know. Oh. <laughs> And see, it cut off there. Um, I don't know why when I converted it, my VHS to digital, it, it converted it to DVD properly. But for some reason, it's cold. The little end of that clip got cut off. She goes, he looks cute with his headband, meaning Spock, this uh, reporter, Pam Martin, who was a, uh, a really sexy anchor person at that time, at that point in time. So let's see here. Yeah. Moving on with the show. So happy 35th birthday to Star Trek four. Now, item. From way back on November 21st, here we are in what, December 2021 already, but back on November 21st, which is my birthday, this gargantuan classic TV moment turned 41. And let's listen to this real quick. This is just epic television. Oh, geez. Why is this not working right? Come on. Where's that clip? Where'd that clip at? Come on now. Uh, I may need to move on to something else. No, hold on. I'm, I'm going to get this to go for you guys. It's Who Shot JR turned 41. It was revealed on November 21st, 1980, who had done it. And it was Kristen, Sue Ellen's younger sister, played by Mary Crosby who is Bing Crosby's daughter in real life. I don't know why the F this won't play. Hang on a second, guys and gals. In the audience, I will get this to work as we're live. God dang, I don't know what the F is going on here. Well, I'm going to try this. Oh, I think I figured it out. All right, I'm going to move on to something else. The reason, I, if you're watching on YouTube, I have all this Lost in Space stuff, like a Milton Bradley board game from 1965, a lunchbox from 1965 in the background, and I had a robot, uh, a, a toy robot from Lost in Space on camera. I'm going to put him back up here. And the reason I did was I found something pretty damn cool on uh, on YouTube. And this was... A digital recreation in 3D of some cut scenes from a key episode of Lost in Space, the fourth episode that ever aired and only aired one time on CBS. It was called There Were Giants in the Earth. And what happened was, I'll be very brief with this, um, the first five episodes of Lost in Space, 
had some new stuff filmed with with the robot and Dr. Smith, who joined the cast after a pilot titled No Place to Hide had been produced in January 1965. CBS picked it up as a series to debut in September 1965 on September 15th, 1965 on a Wednesday night. And in the fourth episode, there was a giant played by Lamar Lundy, who was a pro NFL football player at the time when this was filmed in January 1965. And he played the giant. Well, there were some scenes that were cut due to budgetary reasons, and they really flesh out some interesting um, details about the giant. The giant is perceived in the in the aired version to be just a monster. And it turns out he's kind of a good guy. Let me just play a couple quick re I want to play this great scene with this gentleman gentleman who played uh, Jonathan Harris. He voiced Dr. Smith and he did a really, really good job. I think he did a fantastic job. And I'll tell you how you can see this on YouTube. I'm just going to play. It's very short. It's like a seven minute long video but let me see if i can get this to go uh let me fast forward here seven minute clip okay and listen to the dude that's playing the robot that's voicing the robot dick tufeld was the announcer and narrator of the original lost in space now it's on netflix season three is about to drop the last season of the new lost in space What's going on here, and this is in the aired episode, the robot ventures out um, to explore the planet they just crashed on in the previous episode, episode three, the planet they named Preplanus. Anyway, he ventures out when um, Will sort of tampers with the robot and gets him to shut off the uh, force field and goes out and he finds the robot. Well, in the aired episode, he comes back and he's just messed up. Like the robot's just spinning around in a circle. And he's like, he just doesn't believe this giant that he saw. Well, they actually were going to film the scene with the robot and the giant. I guess it's better seen. Let me just get to the Dr. Smith impression. It's a cool, cool scene. It is totally visual. So I'm wasting your time by playing it. And then there's a scene with Penny confronting the giant. And the voice work on her wasn't as strong as Dr. Smith by an actor named Michael... Uh, Penzaro. Let me see here. Here we go. Listen to this. He's voicing Dr. Zachary Smith. He does a fantastic job. He's working on the robot outside the Jupiter 2. Alone at last. I thought they'd never go. A little brisk, perhaps, but hardly enough to be concerned about. A cozy fire and some warm egg candy. The giant's walking up behind Smith. He doesn't know what's going on. I don't know why he doesn't hear that You're thumping. You're still just a little nervous and upset. That's what happens when you allow yourself to fall into inexperienced hands. Of course it does not compute. A humanoid can't be 16 meters high unless... <laughs> unless... <laughs> Do something! Don't just stand there anything! Shoot him! The robot shoots the giant and he lumbers off And so what's revealed is that like Penny in the scene, I didn't bore you with because it's more visual than anything else. She gives the giant a flower. And so in this scene, the giant is trying to come up to Smith and the robot and give them the flower. And that's when Smith panics to shoot, shoot, shoot. And so the robot shoots his lasers on the ro on the giant. And so anyway, it's in the script. It's in the original script. Anyway, I'm a lost in space nerd. You probably tuned out. I just wanted to go over that. And I thought that Michael, who's been on the Nostalgic Pod Blast before as a guest, he does an incredible impression of Jonathan Harris as Dr. Zachary Smith. Now I'm going to try to play that other clip that would not go. Right. I got it. Thank God. Who shot JR? Okay. Who shot JR? All right. It was the season three 
cliffhanger from the end of season three, from the end of the 1979 to 1980 season. So all summer long, it was a big craze around America in that time. Who shot JR? It was all over magazine covers. Larry Hagman's in a wheelchair on the cover of People magazine. There's there's fake money being made with Larry Hagman's image. And he was renegotiating his contract at this time. And he got a big, fat increase in pay because the ratings were tremendous. In fact, um, on November 21st, 80, when you found out who shot JR after a long wait of months and months, it beat the ratings record that the final fugitive titled The Judgment Part 2 had set back on August 29th, 1967 on ABC TV. So this beat that record. Let's listen to a little bit of the phenomenon of who shot JR. Episode was almost an accident. I believe you knew that. Hang on. Who shot JR? Episode was almost an accident. I believe you knew that. You'll regret this. Is that a threat, Vaughn? The cast members were the last people to know. You're a drunk and unfit mother. Everybody wanted desperately to know the answer. Who shot JR? I've put up with all the wheeling and dealing and backstabbing that I'm going to. So they just said, uh, let's shoot the son of a bitch and see what happens. He's got to be stopped. I don't know if I can summarize Dallas because I've never David Jacobs. It. it just he's uh, the creator of Dallas. Is, who's uh, speaking was the right show uh, for a specific era in American history with some wonderful characters and some terrific actors playing the parts um, that captured the world's imagination as no show had ever done before. Dallas was bigger than life, I suppose. Linda to Gray give you a played big Sue Ellen. Overview: It JR's was wife. Texas. It was the '80s. It was the Reagan era. Um, you know, everything bigger than life, you know, shoulder pads, hairdos, jewelry, cars, you know, the whole thing. Dallas Cocaine. No. was a show Charlene Tilton, who played Lucy speaking. And we can all relate. We all have family. How do you stand on this? You don't have to ask, Ron. The Ewings are a family. It was a very wealthy family, hardworking family, hard drinking family. And um, it was about all the relationships. Hagman was sort of the um, leader of the parade when it came to Dallas. We all took our cues off of him after the first season, uh, and he was the undisputed central figure on the show. Um, it was his behavior and his attitude and his work ethic that set the standard for the show. I remember he called in after reading it, and he said, "Well, how? Why do we? How do we understand uh, J.R. Ewing?" I said, "Well." He's he's the eldest, and he's taken on all the responsibility of the family, and he's increased the the uh, the worth of the the riches of the family fifty fold, and his father still likes his little brother best, and the the actor was happy with that, and he said, well, how are we going to make him more sympathetic? And I kind of looked at the others in the room, and they said, go ahead. And I said, well, I don't think we are. I think what he's discovered is that he likes being dead. I don't have anything to apologize for. And the explanation is very simple. You gambled and you lost. Now, he won't, would never admit that he likes being bad. He thinks that way. He thinks you screw them before they screw you. That's how the world works. That's how business works. But he's really creative at it. Well, I figure your share ought to be about uh, half a million dollars a year. <laughs> Harry, this is what I want you to do. Close down that field. That's right. Shut down every single whale. And so he, since every time he outsmarts somebody, he thinks of himself as outsmarting somebody who would have outsmarted him, taken advantage of him, he gets great pleasure out of it. And then what Larry Hagman did is take that and really make it lusty. You know, he just loved being bad. Are you trying to flatter me or insult me? I can't make out which. Well, every time they, they said, JR enters 
the office with a scowl on his face and everybody is worried. His secretaries are intimidated. And I always came on with a smile on my face, which made him really worried. <laughs> so Speaking of secretaries, you know who played his secretary in the early episodes, including the pilot and first episode? That would be Tina Louise, better known as Ginger on Gilligan's Island. Kind of played against type there. And I played him like a human being. He was just um, used to being in control and expected it, didn't think anything about it, really. And he enjoyed life and he enjoyed, you know, uh, handing out what revenge and so forth. He was a vengeful guy in a way, but he took a great deal of pleasure in it, which made him kind of interesting. The thing that made J.R. Ewing so cool was that he would do terrible things, but he'd do it with that little smile and you just want to smack him because it didn't seem like it was bad. And all the bad stuff kind of trickled down to me. Bobby turned out to be a good guy and mama was wonderful and daddy was great, you know, and I, I was just the bad guy. So that was like a license to steal as far as I was concerned. Bad guys seem to have uh, more fun than anybody else. You know, poor old Bobby. I mean, I love Patrick Duffy and he had the hardest job to play in the whole show because he was the, he was the guy with the morals. And I was the amoral guy. I got the women and I got the money and I got to stab him in the back at least three times a year. And it was really fun for me. One of the greatest discrepancies, for the want of a better word, in the industry was not recognizing Hagman's portrayal as J.R. on Dallas. One of, the, one of the great acting jobs in television. J.R., I opened those wells myself. Yeah. And I shot him. You shot him? Who gave you permission to do that? Nobody. I did it all by myself. Come on, Larry man. Was born and raised in Texas, in Weatherford, Texas. So he came in, you know, guns blazing, big hat, full blown Texas accent. When I first met him, I thought, who is this character? We were in a room at, in Burbank, um, and Larry came in with his uh, saddlebags. You never seen Audrey Magini? Major Anthony Nelson, Nelson formerly Captain Nelson? With his cowboy hat and his, you know, saddlebags, pops the champagne. And it was at that moment, I think, that I thought, we're off to the races. I don't know how long this race is going to last, but we're going. We're going to have a great time. You can stop that Mr. Nice Guy act of yours because, J.R., my darling, I no longer give a damn about you either. Oh, okay. I don't know. And I could pretty much honestly say that. I mean, we had an idea. but we About who shot J.R.? Um, I shot an ending. I knew that wouldn't be used. Because I said something like, take that and that and that, you schmuck. When is Lucy ever going to call JR a schmuck? <laughs> I think everybody wants to think that they know and they're, they're in the know. I recorded it in a, in a sound booth. So when you hear it, uh, I said in the sound booth, Kristen, it was you who shot JR. So um, nobody else was in the sound booth. <laughs> Just me, so I knew. All it's right, Kristen so there you have it. Um, it was a big deal back then. And as I said, it broke the record of The Final Fugitive, and that Final Fugitive broke the record of Ed Sullivan with The Beatles. And um, this Dallas record from November 21st, 1980, stood until the final episode of MASH aired on CBS, same network as Dallas, on February 28th, 1983. Item. Every Thanksgiving. Now, we're in December 2021, way past Thanksgiving, but since I took a little hiatus, I did want to play this clip that we hear pretty much every Thanksgiving. Here it is. From a classic sitcom. I can see it now. It's a, it's a helicopter. And it's coming this way. A helicopter. It's flying something behind it. I can't quite make it out. It's a large banner. And it says, uh, happy thanks. <laughs> all right so i'm not gonna i'm gonna cut it right there because it's getting really late <laughs> as god is my witness that that turkeys could fly every thanksgiving you hear that classic yet tired clip um it's pretty cliche because everyone posts it on their social media and it's not really laugh out loud funny in my opinion but i just wanted to play that because it is nostalgic it is nostalgic, but here's a stupid fact. Um, and this is the network's fault, CBS. It's not the producers of WKRP in Cincinnati's fault. That episode, Turkeys Away, that I just played that clip from, originally aired on Monday, October 30th, 1978, before Halloween, well before Turkey Day that year, which was on Thursday, November 23rd, 
1978. Um, so weird because there was a new episode that aired November 6th. I don't get it. That just that's that's typical network programming fails. That's a typical network programming fail right there. Anyway, but I want to thank um, some of the audience members for great Thanksgiving greetings. Um, June, Scooter, and many more. Um, thanks very much for that for everybody. It wasn't for me. It was for everybody. You posted some funny Happy Thanksgiving stuff in our Nostalgic Pod Blast Facebook group. That was pretty cool. Oh, you know what it's time for now? And I've got to move this along because I don't want to have another epic length pod blast. I've been going six hours, five and a half hours. It's ridiculous, man. I try not to go longer than three hours, but I have diarrhea of the mouth and a lot to cover. But it's time for birthdays. And there's just a few. I, I edited this down in the interest of time. Continuing the Valentine's Day conceptions. Anyone that was born in November very well could have been a Valentine's baby meaning a Valentine's lay. <laughs> um, we're going way back, though, to November 24th here with this guy. We talked about this show earlier. Happy birthday, happy belated birthday to the actor who played Chip Douglas on My Three Sons. Stanley Bernard Livingston was born on Friday, November 24th, 1950 in Los Angeles, California. Besides the star of My Three Sons, movie star Fred McMurray, Stanley Livingston is the only cast member to remain on the show for the entire 12 seasons. Which began on ABC TV on Thursday, September 29th, 1960 at 9 p.m. The show left the ABC television network for CBS in full color. All the black and white episodes were on ABC. When it went to full color... They changed networks to CBS at the start of the sixth season, which aired on September 16th, 1965, which was a Thursday night at 8.30 p.m. with the final episode of older brother Mike Douglas played by Tim Considine. CBS eventually moved the hit sitcom to Saturday nights at 8.30 from September 1967 until September 1971. The final primetime episode of My Three Sons aired on Thursday, August 24th, 1972 at 8.30 p.m. A whopping 380 half-hour episodes of My Three Sons were filmed, making it one of the longest-running live-action sitcoms in television history. A Thanksgiving primetime reunion special of the cast of My Three Sons and the Partridge Family, what a strange pairing that is, aired on Friday, November 25th, 1977 at 8 p.m. Stanley's own younger four-eyed brother, Barry. Remember the kid with the glasses? Ernie on the show, that was his character name, Ernie Douglas. Played his adopted brother in later seasons. Although Stanley is best known as Chip Douglas, he acted before that as a child in The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet as Stanley. And he was also directed by Richard Donner, who passed away in 2021. And Richard Donner directed theatrical film X-15. And Stanley Livingston played Mike Brandon in that film, as well as appearing in the Doris Day classic movie, Please Don't Eat the Daisies. After My Three Sons ended, Stan appeared in the hit show Room 222 in season four of that show out of five seasons, as well as performing voice work in The Roman Holidays and Devlin. Before retiring, Stanley was a producer and director in Los Angeles. In recent years, Stanley Livingston produced The Actor's Journey Project, which is an extensive collection of interviews which he conducted and directed of top Hollywood actors, directors, casting people, agents, and more in the entertainment industry for multiple DVD volume releases. And I mean, he, he directed big time people. Um, he directed uh, Henry Winkler, Ron Howard, Richard Donner. Um, people who are no longer with us, like Sherman Hemsley, who was George Jefferson. Um, oh, I love this guy, uh, Fred Berry, who was rerun on What's Happening. Now, that not, might not be a top-tier actor, but to me, that's a pop culture icon. I loved What's Happening and rerun. And Stanley uh, interviewed him. Um, oh, and uh, Scott Wilson from In Cold Blood and The Walking Dead, who is now deceased. He got a lot of good material, and the the 
the reason for this DVD release, it's for actors that want to understand the business of acting. How do you get an agent? How do you get started? It is a business. Show business, of course, is a business. And so Stanley Livingston broke it all down for the up and coming actor. Um, man, there were so many more. I'm probably I'm not remembering off the top of my head. He might, I think he, he got the Howards, um, man, like Ron Howards. Um, he had, oh, he had uh, Ron Howard's dad, and I think he had his brother Clint. And um, man, he had just some big time talent. I already mentioned Henry Winkler. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, look it up the Actor's Journey Project or the Actor's Journey. It's really good stuff. And by the way, did you know that Stanley Livingston also had a hit 45 record? And I'm going to play a little bit of it, if not the whole thing. Here's Stanley Livingston, Chip Douglas. Wait a second. Where is that damn clip? You know what? I don't have the clip. I don't have the record because I wanted to ask permission before I played it. But here's a, a brief little interview, and it does play a little bit of the record in this interview. This is courtesy of Edward Torchy Smith YouTube channel. Here's an interview with Stanley Livingston and some facts about Stanley. Frank Duvall did the music for my three sons in most of the series. And I've been thinking about it all night, and I don't know what to write. I've been writing, producing, directing music videos. Great. I was going to ask you something. Hurry up. The bell's going to ring. Well, would you go to a teenage party with me? What was my mother like? Somebody says they've spotted a giant woman. Well, who won the dog fight? Pretty Jasper's cat. Oh. Hello? Hello? I had just finished doing a TV pilot for Jackie Cooper, and it was shot uh, right across from Ozzie and Harris. So they sort of knew about me and called me in, and I was hired on the spot. Heck no. Do you want all the fellas to think I'm a skunky kid or something? Meet the audience, the monsters. David is a brain. David. What's the matter? Here's his record. Wonder who invented hairspray in a can. The girl next door. Titled Hair. There's one thing I can't stand when she goes. Hairspray. Night and day for just one little finger. And again, the hairspray. Isn't that weird? Anyway, um, that's some really strange audio right there, but I wanted to share that with you. So moving on in our birthday list, also on November 24th, happy 72nd birthday to the second Lionel Jefferson actor, Damon Evans. And it's kind of weird. It's very unusual that the original actor who played Lionel on the, on the Jeffersons and all in the family is also named Evans. They have the same last names. Mike Evans was the original Lionel. Not related to Damon Evans, who took over in a, when uh, Mike had a salary dispute with the producers of All in the Family and the Jeffersons. Um, Lionel Jefferson was introduced on the very first episode of All in the Family, played by Mike, who sadly died of throat cancer on December 14th, 2006. So happy birthday to Lionel number two, Damon Evans, back on November 24th. On November 26th, we celebrated the 99th heavenly birthday to the great Charles Schultz. Charles, nicknamed Sparky, created Snoopy and the Peanuts gang of classic animated characters. Charles Schultz was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota on Sunday, November 26th, 1922. Now, did you know this is pretty cool? He not only served the U.S. and the military, but did you know that Mr. Schultz was awarded the World War II Victory Medal, among many other military decorations? 
I didn't know that. And um, unfortunately, on Saturday, February 12th, 2000, Charles Schultz passed away, leaving a wonderful print and animation legacy for all of us and for many future generations to enjoy. I want to play a brief clip from 1963. Here's an interview with Charles Schultz. And I should have had it ready for you. Here it is. This is from 16 millimeter film. So the audio might be a little sketchy here. And this is courtesy of the Center for Sacramento History in California. The Center for Sacramento History YouTube channel. It's from November 4th, 1963 from the film archives. Brown, Snoopy, Linus, and Lucy, the leading characters in the comic strip Peanuts. As a matter of fact, perhaps the best known comic strip characters in the history of that particular art form. Our guest tonight on camera three is the creator of Peanuts, Charles Schultz, who was the guest of honor at an autograph party today, the grand opening of Macy's department store in Sacramento. Mr. Schultz, it's indeed a pleasure to welcome you to Camera 3. I'm sure all of our viewers, as I have, been fans of Peanuts for uh, many, many years. The first thing I'd like to ask you is, that's been bothering me, when you're drawing Peanuts, do you direct it at the children, as we think of most comic strips, or at the adults? Oh, definitely, I do not direct it toward children. I think I direct it more at college, uh, college age level but always, of course, with the hope that everyone will like it. Mm. And uh, it's surprising me that the scope of fan mail, which we get, it usually starts with children at about the age of nine and then goes clear on up and includes all sorts of grandmothers. <laughs> <laughs> you have uh, five children of your own. Do they serve as the inspiration for the strip? Not as much as one might think, because uh, these things that the kids do in Peanuts are pretty wild. But uh, now and then I get a few ideas. You don't have a Lucy in the family. Well, we have several Lucy's. <laughs> <laughs> do you really? Yeah. yeah, they all do their share of fussing. And, uh, we have several Charlie Browns. You see, there's a little bit of, uh, of everyone in these characters. Mm. Your, uh, your new book, Security as a Thumb in a Blanket, is uh, already high on the bestseller list. As a matter of fact, you haven't been off the bestseller list for a long time. Now, this is kind of unique in the history of comic strips, isn't it, that books based on comic strips would sell so much? I guess it is, although uh, there have been a few in times past, but not recently. I think it's mainly because of prejudice. They just don't like to see this sort of thing on bestseller lists. Mm. When you first began to draw Peanuts, did you, did you feel at the time that you had something completely different that uh, would sweep the country as it has done? Well, I always had that hope. I was just doing what I felt I could do best. And I was, uh, I had this hope that someday people would begin to like it. I bet you didn't think you were going to be advertising automobiles on television with your <laughs> strip, no, though, did you? No. And I never thought that I'd be at the opening of stores and things of this sort. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever drawn anything but Peanuts? Uh, when you first started, was the strip much different? It was a little bit different. I think uh, the focus was on uh, more on Charlie Brown, who was a lot the way Linus now is when the strip first began. But I really got my start doing gag cartoons for magazines and for some of the local newspapers back in Minnesota. You must be uh, interested in a lot of things because your comic strip touches upon world events and baseball and music. And uh... <laughs> Well, this is one of the secrets. It's is merely to pour your whole being into this. Everything that you know, everything that you've ever done really goes into this creation because the comic strip as a medium is very unique. It is a lifelong creation and it just grows from day to day and it rambles sometimes. And sometimes, as I said, it does grow. Sometimes it just sort of lays there, but it is a, <laughs> it's a lifetime thing and you just live with it from day to day. How long does it usually take you to draw a strip? Well, I can draw one of these daily episodes in an hour. And a Sunday page usually takes about four hours. What I try to do is work on an entire week's series at one time. Will the characters ever grow up? I, Sally's getting older, but she's the only one who's aging. Uh, I've had several of them who have started out as babies, but I find that I just can't keep them crawling around very long. Eventually, <laughs> yeah. I've got to get them up on their feet and move them off to school, but they'll never get any older than they really are now. Mr. Schultz, we hope that uh, you are able to provide us with 
peanuts for many, many years to come. One question, which I have saved until the did. end. <clears throat> Will Charlie Brown ever succeed in kicking the football out of the hold of Lucy? Well, he would if it were not for the fact that he is Charlie Brown. And, and <laughs> you see, the Charlie Browns in this life never really do succeed. Mr. Schultz, thank you very much for being our guest tonight on Camera 3. Thank you, Gary. Rare footage right there. One other brief clip with Charles Schultz. He's such an important force in pop culture history. Let's look. <laughs> Goodbye, Charlie Brown. Tonight, a final farewell to the characters that millions grew up with and the man that gave them life. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sandra Bookman. From his pen, the Peanuts gang became icons for more than 50 years. But in an eerie coincidence, both the characters and their creator are gone. Charles Schultz died yesterday, the day before his final strip was to run. Lauren DeFranco joins us from the newsroom with a look back at a man that touched so many of our lives. Lauren? Well, Sandra, Charles Schultz's last comic strip hit the papers today, and those who knew him say he was a master of timing. The artist affectionately known as Sparky died at age 77 after losing his battle with colon cancer. Just a few weeks ago, he decided to put down his pen and retire because he was too sick to continue. Like, um, Wakanda forever. Um, Chadwick Boseman, <sighs> colon cancer is terrible. <laughs> For 50 years, they've been there for us. The lovable loser, Charlie Brown, his all-too-human sidekick, Snoopy, and the rest of the Peanuts gang. All of them came to life at the stroke of a pen. The simple genius of creator Charles Schultz. I think all of the characters are a little bit of me, but I think Charlie Brown is the sort of nice little kid that I would have liked to have had as a neighbor when I was small because he and I liked the same things, and he's a decent kid. It moves me, sort of. It sort of teaches me something. But today, the final cartoon strip moves us in a different way, and the timing of it teaches us something about Schultz's own character. To die the day that the last strip appears verifies the sentence that he once uh, put forth, which was, cartooning is my life. Cartoonist Art Spiegelman created a cartoon tribute to Sparky in the most recent issue of The New Yorker. Charles Schultz is probably the most popular artist in the history of the world. I mean, he makes Andy Warhol look like a piker. He lived an exemplary, exemplary life and was one of the uh, most humble and genuine people I've ever uh, encountered. Uh, and that authenticity rings in every panel. But it was Schultz's last panel that speaks volumes about his passion. It's Snoopy sitting on his doghouse, writing a thank you note to the fans. Sparky says of his strip, it has been the fulfillment of my childhood ambition. Charlie Brown, Snoopy, Linus, Lucy, how can I ever forget them? When I die, my children wrote into the contract, that's the end. Everything has to end. Good grief. But it sure is hard to say goodbye. And by the way, Schultz named Charlie Brown after a friend at art school, but the character was known as his alter ego. Charles Schultz died in his sleep last night at his home in California. Sandra. Thank you, Lauren. To celebrate the life of Charles Schultz and the Peanuts characters, his colleagues are planning a national tribute. The National Society of Cartoonists says all comic strips will honor Schultz on May 27th. Meanwhile, Snoopy is being honored today. The American Kennel Club on Madison Avenue has granted him an honorary registration, the first in the club's 116 years. There you have it. Charles Schultz, just like Chadwick Boseman, colon cancer terrible thing um chadwick of course portrayed the black panther um on the movie screen and uh more importantly he was in 42 the great baseball movie mm, mm, mm. loved it ah oh, he was a he was also great but charles schultz oh man all those peanut specials man i mean did you have a favorite of course you did we all did i think mine has got to be a charlie brown charlie brown christmas that's got to be my favorite. And I got a quick trailer for that. And it's going to air on television again um, in December 2021, which is a good thing. So here's a little bit. This is only a minute long of a preview for a Charlie Brown Christmas. Then Christmas time is here. Celebrate with a Charlie Brown Christmas on DVD. You know, Santa Claus and Ho 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 and Mistletoe and presents to pretty girls. 
Good grief. Join the gang as they show off their holiday spirit. Ugh, I've been kissed by a dog! Get hot water! Get some disinfectant! On a remastered deluxe edition DVD. I've killed it. Oh, everything I touch gets ruined. Packed with extras, including an all-new documentary. Dear Santa Claus, make it easy on yourself. Just send money. Oh, brother. Plus a bonus episode. It's Christmas time again, Charlie Brown. I think they look better when they have a little star or an angel on top. Season's greetings from Peanuts. Merry Christmas, Charlie Brown! I love it. Um, peanuts, the Charles Schultz peanuts specials streams on Apple TV, but on regular old fashioned TV, it's returning after a hiatus on PBS, a Charlie Brown Christmas will air on Sunday, December 19th, 2021 on public television. So that's a good thing. And, uh, yeah, see that movie 42, by the way, uh, I digress there, but the Jackie Robinson story. It's a really, really good movie. Harrison Ford's in it as well, but Chadwick Boseman, oh, he has a birthday in December, and uh, he is missed. Now, continuing on with birthdays on December 1st, the great Richard Pryor was born on Sunday, December 1st, 1940 in Peora, Illinois. And I have a clip, of course, from 1987, January 15th, 1987, that I want to play. This is an interview, and he was on... Uh, the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson a lot while he was alive. But I'm going to play a clip from Late Night with David Letterman on NBC. Let's listen to the great Richard Pryor with Dave from back in the day. Welcome back to our uh, welcome back to our little program we do for you here Monday through Thursday, and we're awfully glad you're here with us tonight. You ready, Paul? Yeah. It's a pleasure to uh, finally welcome uh, our first guest to this show. He is often called the funniest comedian of our time, and he can currently be seen in a brand new motion picture entitled Critical Condition. Please say hello to and welcome Richard Pryor. Yay! I love Richard Pryor. God bless him, man. What a tortured soul such a talent thank god his, his work his comedy lives on forever in his films too not just his comedy his comedy records i really love his art yeah thank you thank you very much for being here this is very exciting i was backstage with richard dominic he's uh so oh, man <laughs> You blew me away. I'll just. <laughs> Ooh, we'll get to him in a second. Okay. <laughs> I, I've known you for a long, long time. I don't know if you've known me for a long, long time, but I've known you. I met you years and years ago, and I don't know if you remember that or not. At the comedy store. The comedy store. I remember that. And, and my first encounter in California. with you, I, I have a really vivid recollection of that. One night I was emceeing, and you were going to go on, and I went up to you. You didn't know who I was, and I introduced myself, and I said, how would you like to be introduced? Uh, when I get up on stage and you, you told me and we shook hands and for the rest of the night I had this wonderful wonderful scent of what I assumed was really really expensive cologne on my hand and I thought this man is very very successful <laughs> it was, I've not had anything like that uh, since and I was mightily impressed by that well, it healed up. <laughs> it's all better now, so you won't get it no more. When you uh, <laughs> now, when you come back to New York, do you, do you, does this bring back a lot of exciting memories for you? It, like when you come back to New York, you haven't been here for a while. You realize how big it is. Mm -hmm. It's like very big, and people are moving all the time. They don't stop for nothing. Yeah. They just go, 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 go. I can't wait to get back in the hotel and go. <gasps> Because yeah. I'm guessing when you go out on the streets, people are just just want to be all over you, don't they? No, <laughs> no, no, they don't. They don't bother me. I go out with my son, so they, I'm I'm bothering with him, so yeah. they don't bother with me yeah. very much. Sometimes they should. Yeah. Should they bother me? Well, I, I would think that you're the kind of guy that people are drawn to, and when you're out in in public, that they would want to get up there and, and shake your hand and, and pat you on the back and stuff. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 so, uh, well, don't let it, but it doesn't happen to me, so don't worry about it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but you, you worked here in clubs when you were a I kid starting out? Cafe Wa. Yeah. That was the first club. It's still in a village, maybe. I don't know if there's still a village, is there? <laughs> I didn't, is the down. Cafe Wa still down there, Paul? Yeah, I was just hanging out there uh, the other night. So down in the village. I don't think it is. Yeah. And you, you started doing television from New York? I started doing, I did the first show I did was called Entertainment Tonight. Uh, it was a summer replacement show. What network was that? That was CBS. Mm -hmm. Like an, an hour variety kind of deal? Yeah, it was in yeah. the summer. And I, Rudy Valley was the host. And I got on that show, and then Merv Griffin saw a tape of that, and he let me come on his show every night for about six years. Is that right? Yeah. And you did you, did you also do the Ed Sullivan show here? Yeah, I did Ed Sullivan, too. Yeah. Now, do you have Ed Sullivan? <laughs> no, I just remembered, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. It comes back every now and then. Do you, <laughs> do you have any uh, uh, special uh, stories about Ed Sullivan? Seems like everybody who did the show has a... I know. I remember Ed Sullivan came up to my dressing room. I did nine minutes, and people just freaked, said, <gasps> you can't do that. And I went up to his room, and he said, well, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> and I want you to do all nine minutes. I do the worst Ed Sullivan, as you can see. But... <laughs> He was a nice man to me. So he let you go ahead and do the nine minutes on the mm -hmm. show? Yeah. And how many times were you on that program? I think uh, about maybe 11, 12, something like that. Yeah. Do you, do you uh, at this stage of your life, do you miss doing stand-up on a regular basis? I know you I do stand it. stand-up in clubs, I miss a lot. I miss a lot. I haven't been on the road in a while. I want to go after my next film. Mm -hmm. I like to get back and do a concert so you can get in front of people and they can ask you, you know, where'd you get them shoes? <laughs> 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 And what, and what do you tell them when they ask you about the shoes? I throw it at them. Say, yeah. here, you smell it. What do you think? <laughs> They're out of back now, thank you. But that's, it's, it's tough work, isn't it? I think that I the, love it. You do love, I love it? I love it. And you do six months of that. It's great because I did films at concerts. I mean, I'm not putting it down and I'm glad the concert films were successful, but they weren't complete. Mm -hmm. You know how you finish it? Then you say, but there was more to do if I just worked on it more. But they offer you so much money, you can't go, no, I don't want it. Yeah. Take that check and stop it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me grab it. Oh, give me that. Thank you very much. You know, right? What about, uh, um, and I don't know that this would happen to you, but but what about hecklers? If you're working in a club or even at a concert? I have two guys. They take care of the hecklers. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't get no real bad hecklers. No, Not no serious hecklers. Most of the hecklers, I get people add to the app. Uh -huh. You know, I don't get nobody just takes it out. Yeah. So it doesn't bother you if somebody does that then? There's a line, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A very thin line. Yeah, yeah. Now, would you would you ever see yourself doing like a a, a massive concert tour or just picking one night? I'd like to do it? like I'd like to do about twenty cities or something like yeah. that. Yeah. I'd love to do that. Yeah. I really would, man. I really enjoy it a lot. Yeah, it'd be a hot ticket. It'd be what? a good deal. Oh yeah, good. Yeah. All right. Then, we're, let's let's uh, we'll do a we'll do a commercial here, and uh, we're going to talk some more with Richard before we bring out Mr. Dominic. But he'll be here. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Pryor is here tonight. What when you were first uh, starting to do nightclub work? I guess back in Illinois in that area. Yes. Yeah. What what were the acts of the day aside from yourself? You, I guess worked as a comedian and maybe an MC sometimes. Yes. MC, what what kind of stuff would you appear with? I'd appear with uh, strip dancers. There was be one strip dancer, and then a singer, and then the MC. I'd do the MC mm -hmm. or the jokes yeah. as it were, and then they alternate every week to be a different show. But I got to stay three or four weeks because they say I had this club yeah. like me. Was there anything, uh, uh, you go to one city or uh, one act would come in that would be a little more bizarre than others? Or was it pretty much? There was a flame dancer I worked with one time. She was great. And you used to do a thing in, in, the, in the black theater. It was called Burying the Show. At the, at, at the end of the engagement, the last night, everybody would do everybody else's act. Mm -hmm. And they'd bury the show. And this guy one time we was doing the flame dancer and the, the mc would be the woman she put on a mustache and she'd come out and do the jokes and then the other girl would sing and it was great yeah. it was, it, it, as a matter of fact there's a scene like that in uh uh jojo dancer right yes yeah when well, you're working the club yeah. <laughs> uh, it's good to see you man it's it was nice to, to see you show. i appreciate you coming here Thank you me. know i saw the other night uh they were running 
uh, an old variety series that you did on NBC that yeah. was on the air. How, how many weeks did that last? Uh, seven weeks or something like that. Seven weeks. Mm -hmm. And it was at the time, it was a really big deal. Uh, and it was with a, a lot of guys that uh, you and I both knew, yes. a lot of mutual friends. Oh, yes. And uh, and it was pretty in interesting stuff that you guys were doing then. And I guess this is a, a photograph from the first show. <laughs> yes. Explain what we're looking at there. and. <laughs> That's the uh, thing I wanted to do, but the NBC censors cut it out. Yeah. And <clears throat> I, I was standing there. I say, as you can see, and you only see me from the waist, just this part. So, right. You, as you can see, I've given up absolutely nothing to be on television. <laughs> and they pull back, and you can see I and, have no genitals. And there you are. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, was that show, was that a constant battle with those? What, what year was this? This was... Uh, Oh, it was back in 1977. <laughs> <laughs> was it a constant struggle to, to uh, keep that thing? Uh... It was a constant struggle in the sense of like we do stuff and the censor would come into the dress rehearsal and go, hold it, you can't do that, please. And I'd go, well, we'll do something else. And you keep trying and more yeah. you, if once you step with them, they keep stepping until you end up with nothing. Yeah. Like that. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder now if, if things are, are any different now they don't care now. <laughs> Anything goes now. Yeah. I just I like want. I, I'm guessing certain things would be the same. Other things might be a little different. But I think you know the pendulum goes one way and then it swings back way. And you maybe don't really gain. I imagine that. television is different. I I guess I have. I don't do it, so I don't know. I really don't. Well, go ahead and test them tonight, Richard. See what this, <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Hey. no. Uh, <laughs> what other kind of things did you do before you were in show business, or when when you were uh, maybe not doing show business full time? Other kind of be, jobs. Be depressed a lot and yeah. <laughs> good money in that. <laughs> yeah. I was depressed a lot. I tried to be a thief for a while. Mm -hmm. I wasn't good at that. What kind of things were you thieving? I, I would. I was second story man. Yeah. Yeah. I'd climb over transits because I was the skinniest one in the gang. They yeah. let me do the climbing over the transit. And you're in there looking for appliances or jewelry or cash or what? Uh, I didn't know. I just get over there. <laughs> I go. I'm in. <laughs> what I do now? <laughs> How long were you uh, a thief like that? Uh, till my father found out. Uh huh. <laughs> he ended my thievery career yeah. real quick. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the in in the movie here, Critical Condition, you you're uh, a guy playing a doctor. You're not really a doctor, though. No, you? no, he's a guy that's a businessman. He gets in a bad situation, and they think he's a cop. And to keep from going to penitentiary, he tries to fake insanity so he can go to a mental institution. And while there, there's a blackout, and they think he's the doctor in charge. Yeah. And he takes over like that. He yeah. don't know what he's doing. Yeah. And sort you're, like you're running the show, though. Yeah. 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 Do, do we have some of that here? Okay, let's take a look here. Uh, we have time for this? Uh, it's a minute or so from uh, Richard Pryor's latest film entitled uh, Critical Condition. Here he is now. No clip. Do you, you ever have any interest in being a doctor? None whatsoever. Yeah. Never did have an interest in it, but I, I like them. I think it's amazing. They go to school eight years, you know, at least. Mm -hmm. And then people don't want to pay their bills. That tickles me. I mean, <laughs> you know, you do something on them, the guy goes, I ain't going to pay that much. <laughs> then you break the other arm or something. Let me, uh, uh, you're married again, Richard. Yeah, Dave. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Where, where did you, uh, where did you meet your wife? I met my wife in Washington, D.C. about a million years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, she was there. I was doing a concert. I met her and I liked her right away. Yeah. And we talked and became friends. That's good. And, uh. So we got married. How old a woman do we have here? She's about, well, the school bus was late taking her home the other day. <laughs> <laughs> now, Richard. No, she's 23. She's 23. Yeah, and I got my son with me. She now, me... wait a minute. What? <laughs> now, how old a man are you? I'm 46. 46, so yeah. she's half your age. She's half my age, so. <laughs> no, nothing. No, I mean, she's smart as me. She's smarter, actually, yeah. I think. Yeah. She knows a lot of stuff. She's a good person. She has a lot of a lot of good ideas, and she's lovely, and I'm happy when I'm with her. Well, there you go. See? Uh, sometimes. I'm sorry, sometimes? Sometimes. Sometimes. Uh, what, what's the woman's name? Flynn. Flynn. And she, is she in town with you? No, she's in California. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't get a chance to meet her. Well, she told me to bring our son. She said, oh, you're going to New York by yourself? Take our son! <laughs> you know, so my son's two, I brought him, and he's watching me taking notes. Yeah. You know. 
Mom, does he have anything to say about New York or probably just he, another? He, he don't care. Yeah, doesn't care. You know, he just wants to say a cookie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier too in the, in the dressing room, but I really do appreciate you coming to visit us because uh, it's a big thrill for us. And uh, we've wanted to have you for the longest time and just come back anytime. I'm happy that you had me here and God bless you and good luck. Good luck with the film. <laughs> How about Richard Pryor? And I love that movie a few years after this. Actually, I think two years, Harlem Nights, where you had some of the best black comedians, Eddie Murphy, Red Fox, and the great Richard Pryor, as well as uh, I think LaWanda Page was in it and uh, Della Reese. Just a great cast. I love Harlem Nights. I'm glad they made that movie while the gang was still alive. Continuing on with December 1st birthday, Sarah, Sarah Silverman turned 51. She was born on Tuesday, December 1st, 1970 in Bedford, New Hampshire, of all places. No clip. Uh, and also Charlene Tilton. We come full circle because we're talking about Dallas. She was best known as Lucy Ewing. She was born uh, on December 1st, 1958 in San Diego, California. She's 63. And I am going to play a couple clips of Charlene. She's my final birthday that I'm going to honor. There's many more, but I'll get to them next year. I just, I just ran out of time. Um, but here is a clip. This is brief of Charlene Tilton talking about being cut from the cast of Dallas back in 1985. Let's listen. It's only a couple minutes long. Oh, I would have never left chosen to leave the show. Never. I, I've loved this show. I've loved working on it. And and I'm really grateful for every minute I've had on it. It's been the most incredible training for any young actress to have. Seven years. I'm a veteran now working with Larry Hagman, Barbara Bel Geddes, Jim Davis, you know, pros. Mm -hmm. So it's been great. You know, Hollywood isn't always the nicest town to work in. And as always, there are a lot of rumors going around about why you're leaving the show. And some of them aren't necessarily that flattering. Have you heard a lot of, a lot of people come up to you and said, you know, gee, did it have something to do with your religious feelings oh, no, or, uh, <laughs> no yeah. that comes from those <laughs> good little papers we all know and love no that's the inquirer not true. The, the subject of any of the cast members religious beliefs never once came up never so including mine and that was not the case so do you think the decision had anything to do with charlene or do you think it just had to do with the character no, it was, no no it if it had to do with charlene i would have never stayed on the show for seven years. No, they they were always very happy with Charlene, the actress, I guess, because they had received so much mail. Um, not, I guess the public was not quite happy the way Charlene Tilton was treated. <laughs> but um, I, they have asked me to come back for like a few more shows, like two or three more shows, I guess. But unfortunately, I can't do it. I have other commitments. I have a commitment I have to do in New York. And it also made you feel good, though, that that many people wrote in. It did. It was, you know, it was flattering to me. And um, I know one thing, no matter what the press has done to me or whatever, I know that there is still, you know, a group of loyal fans out there. I know by the mail I receive, and it means a lot to me. And I know by what people say to me when they see me on the street or in restaurants or whatnot. So, you know, it, that's nice. It is nice for me to know. That, that builds you up, <laughs> lets you know, hey, it's okay. I'm extremely happy. My new husband, Dominic, is, he's a love, and it's, it's really exciting. And this is really right. Um, I was disillusioned with my first marriage. I never thought I'd get married again, but uh, the most wonderful man in the world happened upon my path, and there we are. You and Johnny Lee had a little girl? Yes. Cherish? Cherish. How well, did she get along with your new husband? Oh, she Johnny Lee, the country singer. She Loves Dominic, and he, he really is her daddy. He's the one that's there for her when he's sick, when she is he sick. He's saying, uh, looking for love in all the wrong places. Looking for love in too many faces. Urban cowboy, sorry. When, you know, when she needs him, and Cherish still sees Johnny, and, uh, so that's all well and good. And it's, that's worked out real, really okay. Johnny and Dominic talk. Will Dallas be okay without Charlene Tilton? 
It's a great show. It's got great people. And there's no reason it shouldn't continue on forever. Seriously, I mean, it's, it's great. They can go on without Lucy. Can it? Sure. Oh, well, that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> and it did. Um, after she left, it went on until 1991. Then they brought it back for a series of reunion movies like J.R. Returns in the mid-1990s. And then TNT brought it back between uh, 2011 and 2014 for three seasons. When Larry Hagman died, so did Dallas. The ratings plummeted. And, uh, and plus, The Walking Dead at that time was super strong, and it was just setting records for cable television, and Dallas just couldn't compete. Um, now, one other brief clip, and then we'll wrap on birthdays as we wrap up this nostalgic pod blast for the week. Here's another clip of Charlene Tilton, whose birthday is December 1st. On the David Letterman show from February, let me get right on her clip, <laughs> clip, C-L-I-P, February 8th, 1989. I love these 1980s Letterman clips. I just do. Here we go. Let me get this for you now here as we are live. Items. <laughs> Got it. Here we go. Here comes little Charlene Tilton. I think she's like five feet tall, maybe four feet. Nine, four, no, four feet, uh, four feet, 11. Kids, somewhere. we throw them in a gorilla outfit. Uh -huh, so well, that's a, great. I'm... Where the hell is it? Here we go. In February, America's best sports magazine sends a buzz across this country with its annual swimsuit issue. The magazine is, of course, Inside Sports. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please welcome the woman pictured on this year's cover right there. Once again, Charlene Tilton. Oh, Charlene. I, I don't remember her being on the cover of Sports Illustrated. That's interesting. Nice to see you. February 8th. You know what? I made another mistake. This is from. No, yeah, yeah. February 8th, 1989. Sorry. <laughs> how you doing? I'm great. How are you doing? You know, uh, we've never met before, have we? I don't think we've ever met. No, I think we did years and years and years ago. But you know, and I'll only mention this once, uh, aside from being a, a lovely woman, you're you're smaller than I thought you were. I know. That's why the pool table would be great that you mentioned. It'd be in perfect the for you, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. I could use that if yeah. I could decide to take up uh, pool shooting. Uh, and did you? Is it uh, impolite to, to uh, by all means get comfortable? Thank you. Is it is it impolite to ask how tall? Kiss, kiss. I know. Uh, is it impolite to ask how tall you are? Five one. Five one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Five, Five one. one. There it is. <laughs> Is that, is that, well. Impolite to ask, no. No, okay. Um, you've been on the cover of many other magazines, haven't you? Yeah, not quite like this, though. Yeah. How many different covers have you been on? Oh, God, I don't know. Just with the Inquirer alone, probably over 500. Really? So. Wow. But this was a special project for you. Yeah, yeah, that was a very special project. You got to go to Hawaii, and you filmed. You and the girls were there for like probably three weeks shooting. No, I beaches. got to go to beautiful Galveston, Texas. <laughs> How come you didn't get to go to Hawaii? <laughs> well, um, more Hollywood magic. The other girls that they shot were in Hawaii, but I was in Dallas filming, uh -huh. and I didn't have the time in my schedule when they called to at, you know when they called for uh, me to do it. And they were under a deadline, so we went to Galveston. So we went to Galveston, yes. and and what kind of uh, tropical paradise did we find there in Galveston? About thirty degrees. Really? <laughs> yeah, it was in November, yeah. and I was freezing. And we had to to get the beautiful sunset, sunrise, and sunset shots that you see. Uh, I was up at uh, in the ocean at about four in the morning, uh -huh. and uh, it was pretty cold. Why can't I find the other pictures? Because they're ripped here's out. A, wait a minute, here's a hell of a record deal. <laughs> Listen to this. Listen, Paul. Take any 12 cassettes or records for one cent. All right, never mind. Well, never that's mind. not a... Ooh, take that uh, are you... Are you uh, let's, let's, let's find some of these other photos. Now, this one. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Now, was this uh, taken out in 30-degree weather? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, chilly, then, isn't it? A little chilly. Yeah. How long did it take you to do that? <laughs> we only had... Um, Actually, half a day, uh -huh. unfortunately. But how long were you out there exposed to the 30-degree weather? Well, for about four or five hours. Uh, yeah. Where's the other picture of you in the waterfall? Oh, there. Now, tell me about the waterfall. This looks like it's probably some uh, exotic lagoon somewhere. That was uh, 
little bitty waterfall in front of the hotel. See, it's a good thing I'm not so. T- <laughs> it's a good thing I'm not tall. I fit in a little bitty waterfall there. So, uh, so, so businessmen pulling up in the- cabs, dragging their bags out when. Yes. And, yes. and you're you're and laying I'm, in the pool. And I'm just, yes. Uh, are are you are you a big sports fan? Well, I didn't end up on the cover for my athletic abilities. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. I mean, well, I, uh, what kind of things? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm not gonna, you well, know, catch passes from Joe Montana, you know. But do you like sports? Do you, do you go to games and stuff? Aha, uh-huh, they got that. Whoa. <laughs> well, he is pretty cute. I mean, what? Do I go to games? I yeah, said, so do you go to games? I went to. Um... <laughs> <laughs> what kind of games do you go to? I went to the Excuse opening the of the um, Laker Maverick game in right. Dallas. Of course, in Dallas, we called it the Maverick Laker game. Right. And uh, we had seats on the floor, and that was like. Unbelievable. Right. So I, you don't mean right on the floor, of course. Yes, you mean right, yes, on the floor. No chairs, like, no benches, right on the floor. Well, they they floor did they, yes, they yeah. did put a chair yeah. on the floor. And and you're you're back on Dallas this year? Yes. Now what happened? They killed you off, right? They did kill you off? No, they killed uh, Patrick Duffy off and then he ended up in the shower. Mm-hmm, Mine yeah. wasn't so complicated. They just sent me off to Georgia. Uh huh. And why did they send you to Georgia? Um they couldn't figure out what to do with my character, so they sent me away for a little while, and I was off the show for about two and a half years. Uh-huh. And during that time, I just um, did a lot of theater, a lot of stage work, a lot of studying, and now I'm back. And well, what are they doing with your character now? <laughs> I think they're back to just <laughs> trying to make up their mind again. Uh-huh. Um, actually, they've written her a little more older and wiser and getting to stand up. About two and a half years older, I would guess. Yeah, yeah. you know. But- <laughs> Five years wiser. So. It's the Inside Sports Cover Girl, ladies and gentlemen, right there with Charlie and Kelton. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. With shovels, have been cleaning up dog bones. Yeah. Would you like a career in broadcasting? Charlene Tilton. Now, as we wind down this week's pod blast, and thank you for sticking with me. God, we had a lot of fun. It's time for a nostalgic treat of the week. And. It's coming full circle because we talked about Charles Schultz and peanuts, peanuts as in Charlie Brown. Well, this ad will tip you off as to what the nostalgic treat of the week is. to zap gold cake with vanilla frosting, devil's food with chocolate, raspberry with coconut, all with cream centers. Please find your to zap. <laughs> Look for zingers in multi-pack and snack pack sizes. That's two delicious ways for you to enjoy neat-to-eat treats from Dolly Madison. That's right, it's zingers. I used to love zingers growing up. Um, It was better than Twinkies because I love the little icing, the yellow icing on the zingers. I would peel it off and just eat the icing separate and then eat the cake afterwards. And of course, um, the Charles Schultz characters endorsed zingers and they would be all over the wrapping and in the ads the television spots the radio spots give me the facts every time i try to enjoy a zinger it gets zapped see i didn't see anything describe the alleged zingers well there's devil's food with chocolate icing gold cake with creamy vanilla raspberry with coconut all with cream centers it's your imagination charlie brown there's no zinger zapper see When you have zingers around, there's no escaping Uh, uh, uh. the zinger zapper. So that was the Dolly Madison Bakery, which now Hostess owns. But uh, Dolly Madison snacks are probably best known for their long association with those characters. The Charlie Brown Gang. And they were all over the packaging in the 1960s, 70s, and the 1980s. The bakery, along with Coca-Cola and McDonald's, was a major sponsor of the Peanuts animated specials on CBS during that period. And, um, you know, they had different pie flavors that Dolly Madison would make, and they had different characters on the wrappers, including Charlie Brown on the cherry and banana cream pie, Linus on the apple pie, Lucy on the lemon pie, Schroeder on the berry, Sally on the coconut cream and pineapple. I love coconut not with pineapple um frida on the chocolate peppermint patty on the strawberry and peach flavor and then marcy on the boysenberry the wrappers were later redesigned and featured snoopy on all the flavors charlie brown was also on zingers packages wearing a baseball cap 
Snoopy was also on Jim's donut packages as well. I remember that. Remember Jim's the little donuts, chocolate covered and the powdered donuts. Um, original Dolly Madison logo was used during the 1969 to the mid 1980s uh, period. And um, the original Dolly Madison outlet bakery store logo was used from the mid 1980s through November 2012. Uh, during the period when packages featured the Peanuts characters, the advertising agency for Dolly Madison products was Dancer Fitzgerald Samples San Francisco Branch, primarily due to its proximity to Charles Schultz, who was based in nearby Santa Rosa, California. Okay, that was a little fun factoid. Now it's time for the Nostalgic Toy of the Week. I'm going to play a commercial from 1979. If you're on our uh, Nostalgic Pod Blast Facebook group, page on facebook you you've probably already seen this but here it is this was a really cool toy that i had that i got in christmas 1978 when i was just a wee wee toddler <laughs> jaws 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 is the game where you try to fish out what's in the jaws of the great white shark i'm going for the camera made it but be careful, because if you remove the wrong piece, the Jaws will get you. You're out. Jaws, it's you against the great white shark and each other from ideal. I love that game. It was a game you played where you had to fish out objects from the Jaws of the shark. The Game of Jaws is a 1975 game produced by the Ideal Toy Company. The game is based on the blockbuster film of the same name. Duh. Today, the game is rare and is a valuable collector's item, even though it's been reissued. Jaws features a plastic great white shark, as well as 13 junk pieces. The junk pieces are things like tires, human skulls, etc. The game was also released as Sharky's Diner many years later. Huh, that's lame. Despite being based on the mature-oriented horror film, the game's range was initially six plus, ages six and up. Currently, it's been changed to ages four and up. And that's surprising because a lot of those pieces are choke hazards, choking hazards, you know, uh, little small plastic pieces that a, a toddler could choke on. Anyway, and now shall we play a game? A little reference to the movie War Games. It's time for taglines. And this week, there's no clips as we try to hurry this along. I, I, I told myself I wasn't going to go longer than three hours. And look at me. It's over four hours. Good Lord. My voice is starting to cave as well. But here we go. The way this game works is I mention the tagline and you think of the product. In this case, the magazine. These are magazine taglines. I think I have 15 of them for you this week. So here we go with number one. Here's the tagline. It's where the girl ends and the woman begins. What magazine would that be? And these are all legit magazines. There's None of these are nudie magazines. These are all legitimate magazines. It's where the girl ends and the woman begins. That's 17 magazine. Number two, tagline. Kick back, chill out, hang loose. Have fun. Entertainment Weekly. Number three, tagline, Life Well Shared. It's Reader's Digest magazine, the tagline for its advertising. Number four, Man at His Best. Man at His Best. That's Esquire magazine. And a lot of these, if you're younger, you've probably never even heard of these magazines. I mean, most of these print publications are long gone. But if you're a Generation Xer or a Boomer, you'll remember these. Number five, tagline, live well every day. This is a magazine geared towards women. Women's Day. Women's Day magazine. For equal time, since I had a man at his best for Esquire, there's Women's Day. Okay, Women's Day. Number six, news you can use. News you can use. That's U.S. News and World Report magazine. Number seven, tagline, live curious. Or live curious. No, it's live curious. National Geographic magazine. Number eight, tagline, fun, fabulous, affordable. 
fun, fabulous, affordable. And it's a controversial magazine. I remember when I was um, going through puberty, you know, a lot of older um, boys said, oh, you got to look at this magazine. And it, it, it's not a nudie. It's not a nudie. It's Red Book Magazine. That was their tagline. Fun, fabulous, affordable. Number nine, tagline. America's best new home built to live, work, and play. Again, tagline, America's best new home built to live, work, and play. That's a tagline for Better Homes and Garden magazine. Number 10, tagline, genius in America. You give? Genius in America. That Smithsonian magazine. Number 11, tagline, where family comes first where family comes first. That's Family Circle Magazine. Number 12, tagline, connecting the dots. That's Newsweek Magazine. Number 13, fun, fearless, female. Another controversial magazine. Fun, fearless, female. That's Cosmopolitan, otherwise known as Cosmo Magazine. Number 14, I lied. I said there were 15. There's 14 taglines this week. Number 14, tagline, tons of useful stuff. This is another equal time selection since I had one that was geared towards women. That's a hint. Again, tagline, tons of useful stuff. That's Men's Health Magazine. That was their advertising tagline. Now it's time for comedy talk continued. I always like to feature a stand-up comedian. And um, let's see, we got this guy. He's still with us. Thank God. Albert Brooks, born Albert Lawrence Einstein on Tuesday, July 22nd, 1947 in Beverly Hills, California. He's a 74 year old actor, comedian, and filmmaker. Albert Brooks received an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actor for 1987's theatrical Broadcast News and was widely praised for his performance as a ruthless Jewish mobster in the 2011 movie Drive. Albert Brooks also played in Taxi Driver in 1976, Private Benjamin in 1980, Unfaithfully Yours in 1984. He acted in My First Mister in 2001, and he has written, directed, oh, what about uh, America? Um, the one he did with uh, Julie Haggerty, um, Lost in America, that was a good movie. That's not listed here in my notes, but I love that movie. I think it was from 1985. That's a funny movie. And he was in Twilight Zone, the movie with Dan Aykroyd at the very beginning of that 1983 release. Want to see something scary? Sure, scare me. Ah! Anyway. Um, but Albert Brooks has written, directed, and starred in several comedy films, such as Modern Romance back in 1981, Lost in America in 1985, it was in my notes, and Defending Your Life in 1991. He's also the author of 2030, as in the year 2030, The Real Story of What Happens to America. And he published that in 2011, or rather that was published in 2011. Um, the voice work and voice credits of Albert Brooks include Marlon in Finding Nemo in 2003 and Finding Dory in 2016, Tiberius in The Secret Life of Pets in 2016, and recurring guest voices for The Simpsons, including Rusk Cargill in The Simpsons Movie in 2007 and Hank Scorpio in You Only Move Twice. And did you know that Albert Brooks' brother is none other than Super Dave Osborne? And he passed away, unfortunately, his brother, Einstein. But uh, I used to love that show, Bizarre. It was on the Showtime cable network. And he'd always say, ah, oh, you, you putts, after he uh, had a calamity. Oh, man, I love Super Dave Osborne. But uh, let's listen to some comedy from way back in 1973, some stand-up comedy by the great Albert Brooks as we wind down, finally, this week's Nostalgic Pod Blast. Thanks for listening on FistfulOfRadio.com, by the way. There's always a new episode Monday night at 7 o'clock, and then we have episodes airing Saturday and Sunday at 2 p.m., and then overnight every night. But let's listen to the great Albert Brooks doing his thing, doing some stand-up comedy. I just have two clips of his. Let's listen to some comedy. This is some funny shit right here. God dang it. There we go. There's mics all around here. There's a recording 
truck outside, uh, a record is being made. There's nothing you have to worry about. Just, you know, have a good time. Uh, I Just don't identify your laughter. A lot of people like to do it. Ha, 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 said Bill Harrison of Phoenix. By the way, you know, this room is full, and I might say that there's a camera up there right now. There's a Jewish audience in the Wilshire Ebell Theater watching this. <laughs> they do that on high holidays. When the temple fills up, they move into theaters, but they never take off the titles of the theater, and thousands of Jews walk out of deep throat. <laughs> they ought to change the title. This is the, uh, for the last eight months, the performing I've done has, has been, uh, as a headliner, I have closed the show. Opening is another story. The, the first, Neil Diamond was the first person that I ever opened for uh, at all. I had done television before that, but never any live performing, only dead performing. <laughs> I met him at a college, I guess four years ago or so, in uh, Mississippi. I, I didn't meet him till the actual show. I was met by the student body president who picked me up at the airport, and he said, you're the comedian, huh? <laughs> yes. We had Al Cap here last night. He's a witty guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I'm in trouble. <laughs> in trouble. It was all right. It went very well. Uh, and I stayed on and off with Neil for about two years. I started with him when he was doing small colleges, and my God, I watched the man price his way right out of the business. <laughs> no, it, it was getting strange there towards the end. He would perform, then the owner of the building would come and give him the deed to the building. <laughs> you owe this, this is my house, this is my car. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. Right away on a bike. But no real bad experiences. Once in a while, I'd be in the middle of my act and somebody would yell, Kentucky woman! <laughs> Happy to have her here. Thank you. <laughs> now, first of all, concert halls are getting too big anyway. What is it? There must be, what, 450, 500 people here. That's a good-sized crowd. Even up to 4,000 in a place like Philharmonic Hall that's built to handle it. After that, I mean, Grand Funk Railroad sold out Shea Stadium. Shit. David Cassidy sold out the Astrodome. 55,000 humans under eight in one building. <laughs> There's a disease in there somewhere. I would just like to see the parking for that. That's all I would like to see. More station wagons in one place than anywhere on the earth. Kids, quiet, kids, 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 kids. <laughs> if, Ford, if Ford ever... If Ford ever had to recall all their station wagons, that would be the best way to... Just hold a David Cassidy concert, sir, right in Detroit. They'll all come in, I promise. <laughs> yeah, but how do we get the Mercury's back? <laughs> get a hold of the coasters. <laughs> it's getting worse. I mean, there are, there are buildings that are... There's no building large enough now, it seems. A Three Dog Night just passed a law within their group, uh, starting, I think, in two months. They will play no more buildings of any kind. They will just play states and do... <laughs> do 30, 32 concerts a year, stand in the middle of Kentucky and play, and everyone pays that day. <laughs> Appearing in Kentucky, Three Dog Night! Liar, liar! 8.50. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to Dayton. You heard it, you pay. <sighs> what could the ultimate of that be? They get on a jet plane in New York and fly to Los Angeles and play in the plane, let the military promote the concert and have everyone in the country pay a dollar. <laughs> Excuse me, you two, see that plane? Yes, we do, two dollars. <laughs> let me treat you, honey. <laughs> now, we get, into, we get into certain rough, few rough concerts stand out forever. I will talk about one this evening. I opened for Richie Havens in San Antonio, Texas. I did it on a second's notice. I was in New York going back to Los Angeles. Apparently, they had decided...
to have an opening act instead of not to. So there was no billing involved. The agency called and said, look, your transportation's paid for, you gotta come home anyway, stop off in San Antonio, do the show, make yourself some money. Great, greed almost ended my life. <laughs> Now there was no billing. Now no billing in most places, you can handle it. San Antonio is a different story. Let me think of the best way to describe it in case you don't know. You will hear, read, see, think, draw, imagine, dream, vomit up the word Alamo. till you wanna go and hire the Cleveland Wrecking Company and break it down yourself. The Alamo is there, everything in the town is named after. Every human, every building, every everything. Alamo drugstore, no we don't, thank you. Alamo dry cleaner, in by 10, out by five. Alamo movie theater, 830, 10, 30, 12, 30, yes. Alamo mortuary, no one's dead, thank you. <laughs> Every person walking in the street, there's Alamo Bradley and his wife, Alameda. <laughs> Little Alamo Jr. This, this concert was supposed to start at 8 o'clock. I was in the lobby of the hotel at 7.30, met Richie and his van. We got into a station wagon. Very easygoing guy. Talked to me for a while, talked to the wagon for a bit. Really didn't, wasn't, wasn't a hard man to get along. At 10 minutes to eight, we get to this place that no performing should have been done in. Ever, ever, it was originally built to store manure for the rest of the world. At 8.02, at two minutes after eight, not 8.30, not 8.45, 8.02, 6,000 people are in this place going rich, 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 rich. Thirty minutes, forty-five minutes you can handle. Two minutes is just it's silly. How do all those people get organized that quickly? Richie, Richie. I'm trying to dance to it, make a rhythm song. Richie, Richie. He's sitting there acknowledging. Hey, that's me. I know it is Richie. I was begging for a disc jockey to be there to introduce me. Usually, I I hate it, but. I wanted the disc jockey there because he would come out and the audience would get some of their hostility off on him. Audiences hate disc jockeys. Uh, and they have a right to because generally, for the most part, disc jockeys are the worst human beings in the world. <laughs> now look, if there are some disc jockeys here tonight, you might be different. The disc jockey playing this record right now might be a great guy or gal. <laughs> But for the most part, they're the worst. Now, this is not my opinion, this is a medical fact. So it's not, <laughs> it's not really me who's saying it. The AMA came out with a report about six months ago listing the three worst human beings in the world. First was incurable lepers, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> Second was disc jockey. Third was curable lepers. <laughs> in between the lepers. How you guys doing? How you doing? Don't you touch, you little wrestler. <laughs> Did you guys switch? No, dude. Now the disc jockey comes out on stage, the light hits him, and the audience is boo every time, everywhere, everywhere in the world. In Hungary, boo, boo, boo. <laughs> they just boo. But a disc jockey is an amazing human. I envy him. There's something with his inner ear. The hairs are different. I don't know what's. <laughs> Harvard Medical School is studying the disc jockey's inner ear now. Whatever noise he hears, he can turn instantaneously into a compliment. It's a great thing to see. Boo, you jerk! Thank you, you're beautiful. I said boo, I said thanks. Whatever you say to him. I think your fly's open. It is a great day, isn't it? How are you? There was no disc jockey there. All they had was an offstage mic for me to introduce myself. Now, I opened up the dressing room door. The noise doubled. Richie, Richie, open the door. Richie, Richie, Richie. The closer I got to the stage, the louder it got. I hold my ears. There was, there was a guy sitting at this light and sound booth, the last human being before the stage. A sign said that above him, last human before stage. <laughs> Don't feed. And in the midst of this, Richie, 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 he actually looked up and said, your name Richie? <laughs> no, it isn't. They're going to kill you. <laughs> I love Albert Brooks. Uh, one other, this is a much shorter clip um, from also 1973. Uh, here's Albert Brooks on The Tonight Show. This audio might be a little rough. more bits in here. It's just at this time in my life. There we go. 
It's in mono. Here I am, five years into my career. I have no more material left. <laughs> it surprised the hell out of me. I'll be honest with you, last Thanksgiving, while you people were celebrating, I was down to my last bit. I ignored all those times to write more signs, and I'll tell any young comedians watching, if you get down to the last 20%, it's as good as nothing. Okay, now look, I think there's more inside of me. There has to be more bits in here. It's just that this time in my life, it's so deep that I'll do injury to myself to go in and get it. <laughs> so why am I here? Well, I don't know. I mean, I really didn't want to be on the show, to be honest with you. I thought I'd just come back to this night show when I had something to do. But I should fill you in on my life a little bit. I get 10, 15 calls a day from agents, managers, pimps, lots of interesting people. <laughs> and they say to me, Albert, if you don't go on TV, they're going to forget your face. And then I have trouble shaving for a week, see? I have a record company. They call me every day. They say, Albert, you got a record out? Comedy minus one? The album with the mirror on the back and the script in the middle? That's what How just are heard people going to know it's maybe the funniest record ever made and it's on ABC Records and GRT tapes if you don't go on television? <laughs> And I'd say, look, I don't know. So ladies and gentlemen, man. hey, I could have fooled you. You know what I mean? What? To get laughs? I could have fooled you to get laughs, but that's not what it's all about. I'm trying to be honest with you. I'm what? I couldn't resort to cheap tricks? Come on, I could drop my pants as easy as anyone in the business. You know what I mean? What? I love Albert Brooks. He's so cerebral and, um, I was listening to his comedy. I had kind of a, if you're watching on the YouTube channel, I, I had kind of a frown on my face because I was reading about his brother, um, Bob Einstein. He, um, he passed away January 2nd, 2019, otherwise known as Super Dave Osborne. I just loved that character. And uh, it's pretty interesting. That's his brother, the brother of Albert Brooks. But uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, watching the show and listening on fistfulofradio.com. Um, or on your tune in wherever you hear fine podcast, Apple or on Apple. And uh, I really appreciate it. And I hope you have a great, great December. I can't believe it's already December, 2021. It's the holiday season. Happy Hanukkah. Merry Christmas. Hope you have a great and happy new year. I'll be back of course next week, but I just wanted to wish some holiday greetings in advance. Um, and uh, thanks again for everything. And uh, we'll see you next time on the nostalgic pod blast. Have a great week.